Good evening. This is the Select Board of Brookline meeting for March the 7th, 2023. My name is Bernard Green. I'm chairman of the chair, sorry, of the Select Board. Um, let's start off with uh, public comments. Uh, I'm sorry, not public comments, uh, updates and announcements from the Select Board. Anything from the Select Board? Miriam? I'm just reminding you all that I won't be here next week. Okay. We'll miss you. Yeah. For <laughs> those of you who don't know, I'll be in Ghana at this time next week. And don't, I am. Don't brag. <laughs> I am mean, really excited. Come on. <laughs> okay. A little brag. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Uh, Ghana is a wonderful country. I wish I'm looking forward to going there at some point, too. Um, any other? I'm sorry, Mike. Yeah, um, I just want to bring us up to date on uh, uh, the the cannabis mitigation advisory committee had a meeting. We looked at the uh, equity policy, and there was a feeling that it was very bare bones. And there were a couple of suggestions made uh, to uh, add to it. And so I will. We're going to have another meeting. Uh, I gave people a week or so to um, come back with the suggestions. We'll have another meeting shortly and uh, come back with that. Uh, for a, a uh, uh, for action by the the select board, either to accept um, the suggestions, which I think will be pretty reasonable, uh, or to go with the original policy. But uh, it's, it's not stuck; it's moving. Uh, and uh, I have to say that the, there were some good points raised by the committee members. Okay, great. So, um, any other uh, updates or announcements from the select board? Just a quick one, if I may, Bernard. Sure. Um, so uh, we received this in the mail today. I think everybody can see it. I hope they can. Um, and at first I wasn't sure you know, what to make of it, but um, I then immediately afterward saw a, an email on the town meeting member listserv <clears throat> from one of our um, you know, excellent town meeting members urging uh, women in Brookline to pay special attention to this. And um, uh, you know, I won't go into the details of, of why she thought it was wor worthy of extra special attention, but um, it, it is a um, study that is significant, that is being um, administered by Mass General, and it aims to uh, identify um, the causes um, and perhaps preventions uh, of cancer in women. So uh, if people got this, and I assume a lot did, because I think it was a widely distributed um, uh, mailing today. Uh, I, I would say, you know, we all get these postcards every day. Some of them are more important than others. And it seems to me this one's pretty important and people might want to take a close look at it. Great, right, thank you. Okay, unless there are any other uh, announcements or updates from the select board, we can move to uh, public comment. Uh, John, could you sort of explain the rules to the extent that I, they still I will apply? do that introduction and I'm happy to do so. Um, to the public, thank you for joining us for public comment. Um, it's an opportunity for us to hear your perspective on issues in Brooklyn that matter to you. We have a few rules. Um, each person speaking tonight is limited to three minutes. Uh, you don't need to use the entire time, but you may, if you like, we encourage you to refrain from personal attacks and uh, refrain also, please, from um, addressing personnel issues during your comments. Members of the public sometimes raise questions during public comment. We may be able to provide a quick answer to a question. More likely, we will work with staff to get a more thorough answer and respond over email. We'll let you know when you have 30 seconds remaining and when your time is up. And when, okay. uh, when you hear us say uh, your time is up, please conclude your remarks. If you have more to say, you're welcome to send an email to board members expressing your thoughts in greater detail. Devin, uh, who's first on the list? Before we go, um, there's one person who has asked for additional time, uh, Belina Silva. Um, Robinson. Uh, Robinson, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, and, and I've given her four minutes, so. Excellent. Um, okay, who's first? Uh, Felina did technically sign up first, but I do not see her in the attendee list, so we can transition to Marty Rosenthal. Okay. Hey, Marty, you've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and share your video if you're comfortable, and your three minutes will begin. 
actually for the first time in my life, can I defer till after some others? I'm still writing my comments here <laughs> and trying to trying to adhere to the three minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm we'll sorry. I, uh, uh, anyway, I appreciate being called on and thank you. We appreciate adhering to three minutes. <laughs> I do my best. Okay. The next person signed up for public comment is Neil Gordon. You've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and share your video if you're comfortable and your three minutes will begin. Devin, thank you. Um, Neil Gordon, Precinct One Town Mini member, member of the advisory committee, and I applaud the SJC decision. There's a First Amendment right in America which traces its roots to the Magna Carta, the right to petition your government for a redress of grievances, to which I add this, without retaliation and without intimidation. In simple terms, we can criticize the king, and the king can't cut off our heads, literally in 1215 or metaphorically in 2023. Last week, following public comment, a speaker was chastised by name. In the past, I and others were treated similarly. Full disclosure, I'm not a bit intimidated by harsh responses to my remarks. Neither, I suspect, was last week's speaker who doesn't need and hasn't asked for my help. As speak and said, for those members of the public I've heard here at this podium, be it real or virtual, those who often begin reluctantly with this apology. Excuse me, I'm a bit nervous. I don't speak in public very often. <clears throat> Those reluctant speakers may come to you with, in the scheme of things, <clears throat> relatively minor grievances and concerns. They're less confident than others of us when addressing those in positions of authority. And they're less willing to take the risk of being publicly chastised by those who, by design, can, if they want to, have the last word. I'll skip the rest of the lecture and just say this. Choose your words carefully or perhaps say nothing at all. On a separate but related subject, last week the town administrator in response to public comment referred to, quote, the people who napalm children, unquote. The people who napalm children. As many in Brooklyn know, I'm a Vietnam veteran who proudly wears both a combat action ribbon and a Navy unit commendation, the unit equivalent of the Silver Star. I took an oath in 1969 and I honored it. I rode my ship and I did my job. And I'm not among those who in 2023 paint Vietnam veterans with that broad brush. No, Mr. Carey, I was not, and we, my brothers and sisters are not, the people who napalm children. Choose your words carefully or perhaps say nothing at all. Thank you. The next person signed up for public comment is Marty Rosenthal. If you're ready. Ready, but I'm getting a message that the host has stopped my video. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. I think I'm okay now I'm in. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to be, uh, as usual, a, uh, the opposite of a technophobe, technocrat. All right, so I'm Marty Rosenthal, town meeting member, precinct nine, formerly select board member, precinct nine, lifer, and now my fourth time opposing the Harvard Street project and last week's comment uh, contract. I appreciate John's amendment adding two objectives to also protect and preserve existing businesses but I just don't see how they can do both that and the main objective by June 1st to provide the form-based zoning districts. My main concern has been the utter lack of attention, including the 22 page January 31st memo to that huge risk, which is a very complex issue, maybe business by business saying, saving local businesses of under four stories and indeed Brookline as we know it. I last week appreciated get, getting some Charles Carey reactions to my comments after I'd left for CTOS. And I wanna continue that dialogue starting with him graciously inviting me to meet or talk with him. 
But regardless, it's the whole community, whether they patronize Stop and Shop, Aborn Hardware, or whatever, who have to hear these discussions, which I've called a possible seismic shift. Respectfully, Chaz took a little too much umbrage at my now mantra from Vietnam, uh, we had to destroy the town to save it, alleging that I analogized our planning staff to those who napalmed villages. Please, you all be the judge, as Chaz put it from Oliver Cromwell, which of us may be mistaken. I'd say it's his reaction that's the hyperbolic one, not my analogy. I yield to nobody in appreciating our fabulous town employees, including the planning staff. The week before, I called them technocrats, which is defined as an expert in science or technology with a lot of power or influence in government or, or industry. And I analogized them to JFK's brilliant advisors who were simply wrong on Vietnam strategy. Again, who's mistaken here? Most importantly, Chaz tells us not to worry about existing businesses, but hasn't yet explained why versus the common sense about landlords, newsflash, they like money. Almost finally, I reiterate my criticism of our yes, very smart town council. I today see a March 3rd memo to the board, which I believe hugely overstates the legal risk of resisting, especially for better interim time to study, and which I again believe falls into too common municipal lawyers tendency to tell the executive branch only what it wants to hear. Finally, as to your minutes. You have 30 seconds. To vote on, thank you. Um, having sat up there, I, rec I recognize that taking minutes is a her Herculean task, but the prior week's minutes misstate my thrust and substitute the word exploit for destroy, as well as the Vietnam source of that quote. Um, and. By the way, the previous week accurately reflected what I talked about, about schools and motor, and motor vehicles, but missed my biggest concern, existing businesses. So thank you very much, and I will yield the rest of my time. At this time, there are 17 attendees. No one is using the hand raise or Q&A feature to indicate they'd like to make a comment. I do uh, want to note that Felina Silver Robinson did sign up in advance to make a comment, but I do not see her with us this evening. I wonder if perhaps she thinks the meeting starts at six since we have you know, been at six recently. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Um, could you, uh, Devin, do you mind sending her an email just saying- I have. Okay, well, but also telling her to put her comments in writing and, and distribute it to the board. I can do that. Okay. Okay, uh, let's move on to uh, miscellaneous items. Uh, first question of approving the meeting minutes of February 28th, 2023. Any uh, comments or edits to, the, to those minutes? No. Uh, so let's uh, vote. All in favor of item 3A, the minutes for February 28th, uh, please say aye. Um, John. Aye. Miriam. Aye. Mike. Aye. And chair votes aye. Okay, next, I'd like to take items 3B to 3G in so-called omnibus fashion, and then take up item 3H, which is a proclamation that will be read by Miriam. Uh, so items 3B to 3G are as follows. Authorization to hire in the finance and library departments, that's 3B and 3C. Acceptance of a rebate check for $17,000 from National Grid, item 3D. Acceptance of a gift of $297,170 from Chestnut Hill Realty for improvements to the tennis courts and surrounding areas, that's item 3E. And this requires the select board by our vote, both accepting the gift and approving and signing an access and release agreement. And I'd like to say thank you to Chestnut Hill Realty uh, for this uh, gift that that will be uh, will will be around for many many years uh, to the benefit of people who play tennis, not me. 
Um, and also thank you to Erin Galantine uh, for all the hard work she did in making this project uh, possible in, in many, many ways. Okay, next item is um, road repair contract, that's item 3F. And finally, appropriation transfer request from the Information Technology Department, which is item 3G. Um, any questions regarding those items? No comments or whatever. Okay, um, I moved a uh, favorable uh, vote. Uh, all in favor of items 3B to 3G, please say aye. John. Aye. Um, Miriam. Aye. Mike. Aye. And chair votes aye. Now, item 3H, which is a proclamation recognizing Women's History Month. And Miriam will uh, present this proclamation and, uh, and yep. go ahead. All right, thank you. <laughs> um, so first I'm gonna say, I'm just gonna say two things. That the first is generally, I'm not a huge fan of these proclamations and Bernard knows that. And he did a very um, convincing job of getting me to write this proclamation. And um, I have to say in the end, I was actually very glad I did it. I found it quite satisfying. So thank you, Bernard. Um, and I'm gonna start. So first I, I wanna thank the National Women's History Alliance uh, who provides a lovely sample proclamation on their webpage. I used that to get started. Uh, this proclamation was based on their sample, um, but then edited and, and written by me. Uh, the Smithsonian also provided the history uh, that you will hear in this proclamation. So let me get started. I will try not to make it last too long. Whereas the first Women's Day occurred in February 28th, 1909 in New York City as a national observance organized by the Socialist Party. It honored the one year anniversary of the garment worker strikes in New York when thousands of women marched for economic rights through lower Manhattan to Union Square. Whereas Congress then declared Women's History Week in 1982, which subsequently became Women's History Month in 1987 and has formally been observed annually since 1995. Whereas women's history is history and should be taught, acknowledged and celebrated every day of the month every day of every month. Whereas women of every race, class, and ethnic background have made historic contributions to the growth and strength of our nation in countless recorded and unrecorded ways. Whereas women have played and continue to play critical economic, cultural, and social roles in every sphere of the life of this nation by constituting a significant portion of the labor force working inside and outside of the home. Whereas women have played a unique role through the history of the nation by providing the majority of the volunteer labor force. Whereas women were particularly important in the establishment of early charitable, philanthropic and cultural institutions. Whereas women of every race, class and ethnic background served as early leaders at the forefront of every major progressive social change movement. Whereas women have served our country courage courageously in the military and politics. They're on the same line for a reason. Whereas women have been leaders, not only in securing their own rights of suffrage and equal opportunity, but also in the abolitionist movement, the emancipation movement, the industrial labor movement, the civil rights movement, and other movements, especially the peace movement, all of which create a more fair and just society for all. And whereas despite these contributions, the role of women in history has been consistently overlooked and undervalued in the literature, teaching and study of history, underpaid, overworked and overlooked for promotion in the labor force, underappreciated and unrecognized for intellectual, political and historical contributions to better society. I give an example of Frances Perkins, who was the first female cabinet secretary under ADR, FDR and who literally crafted the new deal and helped pass it. Therefore, it be, be it resolved by the select board of the town of Brookline, Massachusetts, that National Women's History Month shall be celebrated during the month of March in Brookline. Further, the Brookline Select Board hereby urges town departments and other local government and non-governmental bodies to develop programs, ceremonies, and activities to recognize and celebrate women's history every month, not just this month encourages a year round process to study, learn about and reflect on the history of culture and contributions of those who identify as women. Use Women's History Month to support the ongoing struggle for women's rights, for all those who identify as women, for the continued fight for equity and pay, promotion, parental leave, 
and recognition of contributions to Brookline especially and the nation globally as a whole. The Select Board believes in and supports the Women's Health Protection Act, the International Violence Against Women's Act, and the Equal Rights Amendment. Finally, the Select Board believes that for all of us to succeed, women must succeed. For women to succeed, we must teach about their contributions to society and show our daughters what they can do if they set their minds to it. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments before we vote? Um, okay, I move approval of the uh, proclamation recognizing Women's History Month. Uh, all in favor? John? Aye. Um, Miriam? Aye. Uh, Mike? That looks like an eye. <laughs> You're muted. Uh, All right. and chair, aye. Yes, definitely. And chair, and chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Okay. Um, next, the main body of our meeting, or the main part of our meeting, the fiscal year 2024 financial plan, which will, which will be presented by uh, uh, Chaz Carey and Deputy Town Administrator Melissa Goff. Um, it's all yours. Thank you very much to the chair and the select board uh, and to all the members uh, of the broader community who are uh, joining us tonight. Um, I want to thank you, take this moment as well to thank um, the staff who um, put this together. It is a truly uh, amazing months long effort every year involving all town departments uh, and the schools and everything. And, you know, the, the immense ins and outs of making a, a municipality as complex uh, and uh, dedicated as Brookline uh, run. Um, so again, a special thanks as always to Deputy Town Administrator Melissa Goff, but to our uh, another newcomer in this process, uh, Charlie Young, who's the Assistant Town Administrator for Finance, um, and to Devin, our newly promoted Assistant Town Administrator for Operations. I also wanna thank the remainder of the six floor staff for all the efforts that they have done. Tyler, our, our budget analyst and grant administrator, but also um, to um, Kate and Tiffany and Rochelle for all the work that they do on a day in day out basis to make the select board office run and to make this budget possible. So um, with that in mind, this is my first budget and I'm very excited to present uh, the overview of the fiscal year 2024 to the select board. So shall we uh, go to the next slide? Hold on a minute. I've double screened here trying to advance the slide. That's okay. Go. There we go. Um, so fiscal year 2024 is in many ways a turning point um, in the town's uh, um, uh, relationship, you know, on, on ongoing uh, sort of narrative of the decade. We do are experiencing a continued structural gap between municipal revenues and municipal expenses. That is exacerbated by the use of one-time COVID aid dollars to cover one-time expenses and by the limited growth in state aid uh, that has been proposed by the, um, the, uh, the governor. Um, it is unfortunately looking like as the uh, state government has now missed its revenue projections for the third straight month, that additional state aid is unlikely to be a significant player uh, in this year's budget. Uh, which does mean that in as a, as a matter as a consequence of that um given that our um fixed costs and, uh, and and growing costs exceed the revenue projected um we are looking in a scenario absent an override uh of uh shortfalls uh, budget shortfalls on both the side of the town and the side of the school um with that said we are exiting a period of covid pandemic and entering a period of covid endemic uh, COVID is obviously still with us, and for many people, it is a very real and limiting factor in their lives. Uh, there is no return to the old normal. Uh, there is only what my predecessor, uh, Mel Kleckner, called the new normal, um, which is uh, a reality that many of the things that were taken as givens pre-pandemic in Brookline uh, are simply no longer uh, givens, uh, and that we will have to, as a community, work together to develop alternative structures for financing the kinds of services that the municipality and its people have come to expect. Um, traditionally, uh, the, the use of the historical 60-40 or largely 60-40 budget share has been used again this year, part of the town school partnership. Uh, again, this is a, a um, remarkable innovation that dates back to the 1990s that is uh, facilitated harmonious relations between the town and the school budget 
uh, in a way that many other communities still lack um, and view, view us as a, a benchmark in this regard. Uh, and so it is with great uh, um, um, satisfaction, I think, on both our, our end and the end, and I, I don't want to speak for the superintendent, but I know uh, in his efforts as well, uh, to be able to have those frank conversations about the revenue split uh, and it's uh, uh, the way the ways that it impacts both town and school operations. Um, this year, the school budget increases by 1.1%, which reflects a shift of building maintenance costs that were last year covered by ARPA um, to um, the um, um, uh, to their operating budget. That does create a shortfall on the school end of approximately $3.7 million. Um, again, in the uh, um, uh, the absence of an override. Um, for the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, we continue to utilize the American Rescue Plan Act in accordance with the select board's mandates, which has included um, a what I would call a, a, um, uh, a, a unique, or if not unique, um, um, very uh, um, um, difficult to, uh, to replicate in other communities, community-oriented process for seeking out uh, uses of that money uh, in a way that the community has uh, asked for. Um, already, almost $11 million of the $44 million ARPA allocation has been earmarked um, for the needs of vulnerable communities, uh, and that number is expected to increase as part of the community-oriented process uh, for applications that closed as part of the round two of ARPA ana analysis. With that said, there are additional ARPA funds that are being used to cover some operating expenses that sprung up during the pandemic. The most obvious one, for example, is our Zoom license that's covered by ARPA money. Um, there are certain other licenses and um, uh, projects that are covered are under non-competitive ARPA dollars, uh, which we will need to use, which we will need to think about strategically and in our long-term planning to avoid a budgetary cliff when ARPA funding is due to be fully expended at the end of F, at the end of calendar year 2026. Mm -hmm. So this year's total budget balances 404 million dollars revenues and expenses all in. Now this represents a significant 5.2 percent increase over fiscal year 2023. Again, the allocation of the school budget reflects the town school partnerships formula. The superintendent's budget submission from last month, uh, and I believe it's actually from late January, um, discusses in more detail the school's plans and proposals uh, in a uh, no override scenario. Uh, municipal department budgets continue to prioritize uh, employee wages. They are the single largest driver of our expenses um, and they are continuing to rise. We uh, obviously the select board has indicated on a repeated basis at budget summits and elsewhere, the importance of paying our employees living competitive wage. Uh, and we continue to move towards those goals, including budgeting in this year, a 3% cost of living increase, which is above the 2.5% rate uh, for um, uh, the prop two and a half caps property tax growth at, um, but reflects the pressure, the inflationary pressures on our staff. Um, in terms of our capital budget, um, this year, it represents 10.3% of prior year's net revenue. And when, when including debt excluded uh, capital projects, that represents 17%. Um, that is a significant portion of our uh, budget that is focused on capital projects uh, and uh, the costs uh, for, for them. Um, I believe uh, at some point someone indicated that over the last 10 years, Brookline has undertaken nearly half a billion dollars in capital expenditure and capital projects. Um, it is a significant revitalization of the community long term. Uh, it has been focused not only on schools, although schools have been the largest recipient of that. Um, and it is uh, an important factor for us to consider in terms of our long term planning about the degree to which uh, and the amount to which our budget is spent on capital projects, which is, you know, longer term, obviously, construction, the purchase of the purchase of, of uh, 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 long-term investments such as structures. Um, enterprise revenue, uh, uh, enterprise funds are up by 7%. Uh, we'll go into a little more detail about those enterprise funds and what they represent, the in and outs, uh, when we go into some detail on the budget, uh, when uh, Melissa Goff uh, speaks through on that front. Um, our reserves and long-term liability funding, I'm pleased to say, met our goals, um, which is incredibly important for a AAA-rated community. Um, we have hit our goal of having holding 10% in an unreserved fund balance. 
We fully funded our pension obligation, our, our pension obligations pursuant to our plan this year with the aim uh, of having the pension uh, a moving pension toward full funding by 2030. Uh, we have resumed and increased uh, coalitions of other um, um, uh, uh, of other employee benefits beyond pensions, uh, and we've in, in, yeah, and we've uh, increased that amount as well on that front. Um, and again, in coordinate in as part of our ongoing plan to ensure that those uh, um, areas are properly funded for retirees and others. When we look at the fund budget at a glance, uh, you can see uh, the change in property tax revenue of uh, about approximately $9 million. Um, property tax continues to make up the lion's share of our budget. Um, it's slightly down as a percentage of our overall budget this year, but given how much it still makes up, that's not an appreciable change. Uh, it's, I believe it's around 71.8% 70, 70, this year. Uh, we, we will see it on the next slide. I'll see if I recall, if I recall that correctly. Um, local receipts, we continue to see um, positive signs there, but again, we are not at pre-pandemic levels, uh, and we don't anticipate returning to pre-pandemic levels necessarily. There are parts of local receipts, such as marijuana taxes uh, and receipts from um, um, uh, parking meters um, that we have not seen grow back, and we don't anticipate growing back to where they used to be. Um, we do see encouraging parking meter growth, um, but it is just not back at a pre-pandemic level. Um, State aid, um, although it has grown, it has grown uh, net uh, only at a 1.6% growth. This is disappointing for Brookline. Uh, it is unfortunate um, that uh, in a year in which I think the message from the state has been, look at this, look, look at this generous budget, uh, that not all communities are experiencing that growth in budget equally. Um, a big portion of this is the fact that Brookline is what they call a minimum aid community for schools. Uh, so we receive only $30 per pupil uh, from the state for state aid to schools, no more. We do not receive uh, beyond uh, the, the regular allocation, um, not including the so-called circuit breaker for certain things like the overages and funding for special mm -hmm. education. Um, we do not receive more than that. Um, and that is unfortunate. Uh, unrestricted general government aid is only up a so small amount as well, um, despite uh, the fact that overall revenues over time for the state have far outstripped local revenues, which have been capped by Prop 2.5. Uh, free cash had a banner year this year, uh, and that is very exciting for us. Uh, it is a bright spot in an otherwise kind of dim economic outlook. Um, we were very fortunate to have two large one-time payments that could, resulted in free cash being where it was. Um, it took us a long time to certify free cash this year because it was complex. Um, we, all, we had many different uh, accounts that needed to be reconciled in order for it to be certified at the state level. We also had a new finance director, and we're very grateful to him for all of his efforts. Uh, Lincoln, I know you're in the audience. Thank you for all the work that you have done to get us not just there, um, but through many exciting um, uh, new developments and bond sales and, and uh, retaining our AAA credit rating, all of which is very exciting. Um, but free cash is a big component of that. Um, you will see later on in this process that free cash is not something we use for recurring expenses. And there's a very good reason for that, which is because it's unreliable. Um, free cash is not something we use, for example, to pay wages. Free cash is something we use for one-time projects to ensure that we are not creating an unfunded liability. Other available funds, which we'll discuss in a little more detail, various other uh, sources um, uh, down slightly, um, enterprises up slightly. In terms of our expenditures, again, municipal departments and the school department, uh, both significant, you know, uh, even, even though, um, uh, you know, the, as we talked about, the school department's budget represents primarily that increase in operating funds as opposed to the loss in ARPA. It is a maintenance budget, um, but it is a maintenance budget um, that requires additional operating money to just level fund from last year's money. Uh, municipal departments, again, primary driver of cost here is wages, um, but not exclusively. Inflation also drives up the cost of services uh, and the cost of goods, um, which has left us with that 3.5% change. Um, we continue to um, look at um, uh, non-departmental expenses, you know, things that are not uh, allocated to either schools or uh, uh, municipal departments, things like health care, um, those go up uh, quite significantly. We are budgeting uh, and we continue to we continue to think we are correct in budgeting for an 8% increase in healthcare costs overall. Um, and we can talk about that in a little more detail when we get into expenditures. Special appropriations, this is where a lot of that free cash is going. Obviously, it's easy you see a significant increase there. 
Uh, again, enterprise expenses up slightly, um, but since enterprises are revolving funds that need to balance out, that's why. Uh, and so-called non-appropriated revenue, which is very or non-appropriated expenditures, which we'll discuss in more detail, of kind of a miscellaneous category, up slightly from last year. Um, so that's how we get to where we are. Um, Oh, that side of the pie chart we can't see. So I don't know if I was right in saying that it's 71.8. Uh, it is 71.8. There we go. Um, I don't know why it won't show up, but sorry yes, about that. <laughs> I, I was, I, I double checked. I'm correct. It's uh, so that that large Pac Man over there uh, is the property taxes, and that makes up 71.8%. So at 290 million, that's over two thirds of our overall revenue. As I mentioned, so Proposition Two and a Half, um, which I think is important to note for the community, passed in 1982, I believe. Um, that is within living memory of most of us, um, although not all. Um, it, it is a. Um, I, I say that because character is not, you know, it is it is now viewed as a uh, matter of destiny, but in fact, it is a relatively recent um, municipal cap uh, cap on how municipalities can finance. Um, it is restricted to a cap of 2.5, restricts property taxes growth to a level of 2.5% annually, plus a calculation for what is called new growth. Uh, and beyond that, voters must authorize any additional um, uh, one-time or permanent raise in the property tax levy. So the increase over from FY23 to 24 is 8.9 million, just 3.2%. So new growth last year, doing the math backwards in from there um, uh, is uh, less than a percent there. Again, talking about state aid, um, really an, uh, a, 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 a more disappointing net uh, increase here, and only only an increase in unrestricted general government aid by one hundred forty seven thousand um, dollars. Again, Chapter seventy, which is the per pupil, um, we're we're a minimal aid community, and that's all we get thirty dollars per pupil. Um, the Massachusetts Municipal Association, in its uh, analysis of the governor's budget. Um, has pushed for significant increases to both of these numbers. The unrestricted general government aid number, they have pushed for it to be indexed to the growth of state growth rather than locality growth. For Chapter 70 education, they have pushed for a minimum of $100 ahead per pupil. Um, unfortunately, uh, in my, I've recently had the opportunity to speak with members of the legislature on this, uh, and the, uh, the response charitably was go fish. Um, we are unlikely uh, to see growth at that level, um, but it is possible we may see more modest growth in these numbers. But again, I, I would love nothing more than for us to be optimistic, but at this stage, given where the state feels like it is with its revenues, we need to be realistic. Um, another major driver in the net, uh, the drag on net increase in state aid is the town's assessment to the MBTA. Um, after a significant increase last year, uh, it increased again significantly this year. Um, another 4.3% increase after a large increase last year. So we continue to pay a significant amount of money to the, and growing amount of money to the MBTA. Uh, and it is a significant driver uh, of our, of why, uh, or I would say a significant drag on our net growth in state aid. Local receipts. This is good that local receipts are up $1.3 million, 4.4%. Again, it reflects the end of the pandemic era and the start of the endemic era. Um, marijuana excise taxes were level funded at 100, or level hunt funded in this year's budget at $815,000. We expect modest, we, ex, we expect growth in lodging. Um, um, you know, we, we saw, I'm sorry, we saw growth in lodging and we, we view that as, as a positive. Again, people are traveling more, people are coming through. Meals also up. We see people eating out more. Uh, and as a result, our meal taxes uh, are revenue realizing, we are realizing additional revenue from meal taxes. Parking meter receipts, uh, again, we see an increase of $100,000. That's excellent. Um, and the meter fee, we, we do, we have in discussing a potential override uh, scenario, talked about the increase of parking fee, excuse me, increase of parking fees from $1.25 an hour to $1.50 an hour. This was actually discussed as part of the 2018 override, but was never implemented because of the pandemic. Uh, we believe that the time is now pr probably more appropriate for that, even though we will realize less overall revenue from that because we are still not at pre-pandemic levels. Refuse fees have been increased uh, by 16.4% based on the fee increase voted by the select board in January. This will be implemented on July 1st. Um, and as we will discuss later on when we talk about the town school split, this money is going directly back into sanitation services. 
um, both uh, to find a position in the rodent control action plan uh, and to ensure uh, the, uh, that the services are being maintained and provided at the appropriate level. Uh, and so that reallocation directly to sanitation uh, is not being run through the town school partnership split. Um, we saw a, uh, an increase in motor vehicle excise uh, tax payments, um, $211,000 increase, which is 3.5%. Again, motor vehicle excise makes up a significant portion uh, of our uh, tax base, and we're uh, fortunate to have that, uh, that opportunity. Um, so the total certified free cash, as we discussed, 22.8 million, of which 20.1 is being used, and the remaining is being left unappropriated to support our 10% unreserved fund balance goal. Again, this is fiscal policy regarding ensuring we maintain our AAA credit, credit rating. So of that 20.1 million, 13.2 um, is being used to fund the capital improvement plan. Um, that is our long-term, short to long-term capital improvement um, uh, policy that we put in place to ensure that the you know, significant capital uh, undertakings that the town uh, is currently involved in are appropriately funded. 4.5 million is being placed in the stabilization fund, 1.1 million in operating reserves. Again, this is consistent with the so-called free cash waterfall policy. And for a special purpose, um, you may recall early in the pandemic, much of the pandemic-related federal financing came not from ARPA or what was then the CARES Act, um, but through the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. Um, FEMA's COVID reimbursement and analysis is still ongoing. Disaster recovery is a long, long process, and I imagine FEMA costs and analyses will be with us for some time still, even though the FEMA money has, by and large, long since left us. Um, a part of that consequence is that things that we made FEMA, that uh, we made decisions to spend hoping for FEMA reimbursement, FEMA has over time said, you know what, we're not going to reimburse that. Um, and so we do have um, deficits that have been created from FEMA's later decisions to say uh, that's not a reimbursable expense. Um, and we also have some limited, we believe we have some limited exposure on that front under the CARES Act as well. Um, but again, because the FEMA is much more of a um, immediate, you know, in the immediate, uh, you know, weeks and months following the, de the emergency declaration, um, the process of, of getting FEMA eligibility and FEMA reimbursement changed on a, on a constant basis and was a moving target. Um, that does run the risk of us having unreimbursable expenses, as happened here. Um, and so we are utilizing part of that money to cover that. For revenues, other available funds, again, reimbursement from enterprises for general fund related costs um, and a limited transfer from the host community agreement stabilization fund. Um, we see uh, um, HGA, we, we will be spending from that HGA funding uh, in uh, 2024 to preserve current positions that are funded, that are uh, financed through HGA funds. Um, we are seeking to ramp that down. As we discussed in the override presentation uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, we are now in a position where um, host community agreement payments must be reasonably related to actual costs incurred. Um, we are uh, working in close partnership um, with the four retailers in town. Um, and I know they are anxious and I am anxious too, to conclude uh, an agreement for more permanent licensing fees going forward that will replace the traditional host community agreement funds. But again, talking about the new normal, we're not getting a flat 3% anymore. Um, we are getting uh, an amount that reflects the reasonably related to actual costs. Uh, and that does create a shortfall going forward uh, that we need to address in terms of positions that were historically funded by that HGA money. Here you see where our expenditures and where they where they come from. School department makes up the largest share, um, non-departmental next, again, pensions, healthcare, et cetera. Municipal departments at 21.7%. So school budget, we talked about how it's up by 1.1% and why. Uh, 157 was adjusted to reflect the repair and maintenance funded outside the split. $956,000 in shared costs were assessed to the schools. Again, this is primarily adjusting for that $500,000 repair and maintenance item that we was funded through ARPA. And as I discussed, the trash fee is not included in that split because it grows directly back into funding the thing that generated the revenue. For municipal departments, we cover our growth covers fixed costs and contractual increases. It reflects increased sanitation costs, those are covered with that fee, which are covered with fee increases, and it prioritizes that reserve that we continue to build for salary and wage increases. Um, I'm very grateful uh, to the procurement department uh, under the leadership of Dave Janikakis 
for savings from fuel costs. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Dave is uh, notorious, not just in this community, but across many different communities around us. Dave has taken the lead for many years now in procuring fuel, not just for us, but for a coalition of towns and communities, including communities larger than ours. Uh, this has a significant cost savings for all those other communities, and they are very grateful for Dave, who continually gets the best price uh, and makes sure that we are um, spending the lowest amount possible uh, for our fuel needs. So I wanted to give Dave special recognition here because once again, he has realized significant savings for us. Um, and it's just, uh, I, I know many other communities would join me in offering him that thanks. Um, so uh, this year we must absorb some grant funded positions in health and the Department of Public Works. Um, we are restructuring where possible to fund new initiatives and upgrade existing full-time positions. Um, we are trying to support the internal capacity for professional development and growth. Uh, this is something that our uh, both our HR department and our assistant town administrator for operations, Devin Fields, uh, have been focusing on. Um, that does unfortunately still leave us, even when we are making every effort to control for costs with uh, a shortfall. Um, so we are reducing vacant positions and what we hope to be surplus line items to balance the budget. Um, but this is, make, make no mistake, Cutting vacant positions still means that there is there's work to do out there um, that just wouldn't get done um, or would have to be done by fewer people um, if those vacant positions are not restored. Uh, as for surplus line items, uh, where at, while wherever possible we've tried to you know, lower the harm, they do include things like planning capacity, legal capacity. Um, you know, uh, funds within the fire department for certain uh, certain of their line items. Um, it uh, a position in you know, um, and those positions that we talked about, uh, the two positions in the uh, patrol positions in the police department, um, and a position in this office, uh, which we had hoped to be a community uh, coordinator. Um, but in the event that we uh, are in a no override scenario, there just isn't money in the budget for it. Um, so. The um, you know you can see here the override recommendation not only restores some of those cuts, um, but also increases uh, additional full time employees in year one. Um, it for example adds a language access coordinator in ODICR. Um, it adds a road and control action plan position. Uh, it actually adds two road and control action plan positions. Um, and I apologize, we continue to tinker with these numbers um, in the uh, leading up to the hearing next week uh, on uh, possible override, possible override uh, bottom line and, and priorities to outline to the select board. Um, so we continue to move these things around, uh, although the bottom line has not yet changed. Um, so we we're talking about additional positions there, bringing on a full-time uh, geriatric social worker uh, at the Council on Aging up from a part-time position. Uh, and other and other areas there. So uh, that is where we are, not just in terms of restoration, um, but um, uh, improving town services through the possibility of an override. So if the override is not approved, these are the things that we were talking about. Again, the vacant community engagement position, vacant patrol officer positions, um, outside consulting for the legal services department, consulting services for IT, planning budget, um, transportation consulting, um, um, and um, you know you can you can see that wherever possible we have tried to spread this around. Employee education software and HR, um, you know, would be in a really unfortunate loss as we try and emphasize um, um, employee development and internal development. Um, but we are where we are, uh, and in the event of a budget shortfall, we will try and make we will make these cuts uh, to ensure continuity of operations the best we can. So as I mentioned earlier, we have an assumption of an 8% rate increase for the group health insurance. Uh, we belong to the GIC collective uh, that uh, offers insurance to many different municipalities. We anticipate seeing the final rates for that. Uh, they would, final rates for that will come out later this month. Um, we also have a projection for increased enrollment um, as new employees come on board. Um, pension funding. Um, this is another major win for the finance department and for Melissa and for the team and, and Charlie and the team involved there. Um, because we are continually able to meet our pension obligations and future pension obligations, the rate of investment return assumption we make on the pension is down. That's good um, because it means we're not assuming a, 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 as rosy a market as, as, as we possibly can in the hopes of meeting our pension obligations. We're assuming a much more realistic 
growth of our pension over time. Uh, and again, we anticipate with the um, amount that we are constantly putting in, uh, level a full funding date of 2030. Our contribution to OPEB liability, again, rate of investment return assumption is down, which is good. Um, we uh, made that additional contribution of $250,000 uh, this year, and we anticipate it continuing next year. So um, revenue financed capital budget, um, that is to say things that we are financing uh, directly from revenue and not from either excluded or unexcluded debt will be 16.2 million in FY 2024. Um, that is 3.1 million from the general operating revenue uh, the year in year out and that 13.1 windfall from free cash. Um, debt services decreased slightly by $93,000, 0.3%. Uh, but again, capital expenses up uh, and they exceed the target uh, of 7.5. Why is it important to have a target? Why is it important to try and limit your capital expenses? Because you want to be spending a reasonable but not over amount uh, of your budget on capital projects. You want to be spending it on operating expenses. You want to be spending it on um, not just the big ticket buildings uh, and, and um, vehicles and things that you can buy on a one-time basis. You want to be providing additional services uh, at the level that people have come to expect. Um, so capital expenses are slightly outsized in the town's budget um, from our ideal target. Um, but we have a lot of capital projects and we have a backlog from the pandemic. Um, so while it is a matter for us to obviously continue to keep an eye on, um, it is not that like we lack for capital projects to undertake, as you will see when Melissa presents the CIP. So the peer school financing assumes the town's share of it, which is to say the stuff that's not paid by the state through MSBA at $173 million. Um, and that will be financed over a term of years through debt, uh, excluded debt. So non-appropriated expenses. Again, we mentioned the MBTA assessment. We are uh, a constituent, we are an exclave of Norfolk County, and as such, we pay a Norfolk County assessment for the services that Norfolk County provides us. Uh, we also pay the overlay for tax abatements. Uh, for enterprises, um, there was an increase in the MWRA assessment for water and sewer. Uh, that drove some of the growth in expenses there. Um, there was a growth uh, in uh, the driving range for the golf enterprise and also an increase in payment for the maintenance shed. We took out a loan uh, on that front. So um, I'm talking, we're going to move from the overview of um, revenues and expenditures to policy issues and initiatives, uh, which are covered in this budget. Um, obviously, the largest policy initiative for this fiscal year is the possibility of an override. Um, as we discussed in some detail in a separate meeting, um, the override uh, on February 14th at a joint meeting of the select board and the advisory committee. Uh, that meeting was recorded. Uh, I strongly encourage folks that if you have not yet sat through that proposal and talked through it or looked through the presentation that accompanied it, uh, to please do so. Uh, that does cover in significant detail the details of where the town's current uh, line items are for a, a potential operating override. Those have not shifted in terms of priority uh, since that conversation, although in some areas we are trying to make sure that, the, the as I mentioned with the Road and Control Action Plan as an example, making sure that everything balances out uh, and that all the priorities that the select board have out, has outlined are appropriately funded. So to summarize, oh, I'm sorry, uh, to summarize, we're trying to maintain services we already provide. We're trying to restore services we cut during the pandemic. The single largest line item in the town's override is to get the road funding up to where the 2022 transportation plan says it needs to be um, so that we have money available for other things and aren't constantly spending money we shouldn't be spending on uh, on, on uh, roads that failed that we, that we should have conducted preventative maintenance on years ago. Um, we want to increase planning capacity so we can grow sustainably and rely less on overrides in the future. We want to fund long-term waste and pest control. We want to take steps towards fossil fuel-free futures, preserve natural resources like the tree canopy, provide expanded services to vulnerable populations, reorganize key municipal departments, and pay competitive wages to town employees. There are two additional potential standalone override uh, line items on the ballot um, that could be on the ballot if the select board so decides. The town proposed these separate from the base override because they are self-contained proposals that the community can make a decision on whether or not they view uh, as, as um, projects that should go forward using property tax dollars and whole or in part. 
um, for low to moderate re uh, income recreation scholarships. Uh, it is providing scholarships to low and moderate income residents for recreational programming. Uh, the Warren Article 26 Committee report issued last year um, estimated the cost of that uh, program at approximately $1.3 million. Um, this, um, this line item would call for $1 million of that to be funded uh, through a property tax increase, and the remaining $300 and change thousand dollars would be financed through uh, either enterprise um, or donations. Uh, composting services for households on town service. And I want to realize uh, with apologies uh, that when we discussed this uh, in front of the advisory committee, I erroneously said that this is for all households in town. This is for all households on town um, waste services. This is not, if you have a private collector, it would not impact you. Um, this is an, an addition to the services that the town already provides. This is not a blanket across the board composting project. Um, if you were, to, if the select board were to suggest financing this through an additional fee, uh, we budgeted you know, approximately seventy-five dollars a year. Um, the cost overall in phasing it in over three years would be approximately one hundred eighty-one point eight five million dollars. Um, if you were to add this without a fee, and uh, it would just be part of regular waste management services that the town provides for its set fee, the additional cost in property tax value would be two point two five million dollars. So either of these questions or neither of them can be added separately to the ballot by the select board. And again, the hearing on this subject is next week. The select board's vote on the subject is scheduled to be the 21st. Continuing the discussion of initiatives, obviously smart, sustainable, equitable development. Uh, and there are two interlocking components of this. One is addressing climate change, aiming for a 2040 zero emissions goal. Um, the town has recommended to the ARPA uh, funding committee uh, a package of just under $5 million uh, in town expenses, which includes a $4 million ARPA green package uh, designed to make significant steps towards a fossil fuel free future for the town and the broader community. We continue to collaborate with the Zero Emissions Advisory Board, uh, and the, uh, who is working in close contact with our sustainability director uh, to continue to look at and operationalize sustainability initiatives and uh, seek out, importantly, grants to actually make sure that they come into being. The specialized energy code voted on at the special town meeting in January will be implemented in summer. In addition, um, we hope that the regulations involving the so-called 10 towns pilot energy code that would allow a ban on all fossil fuel usage in new construction will be ready for the November town meeting. Um, I will add uh, an important caveat to that, um, which is that uh, the current thinking on that is that only communities that are uh, above the um, specialized housing index safe harbor, which is to say 10% or more uh, of our housing on, on the index monitored by the state is affordable. Um, if we are not above that level, uh, we may not qualify for that uh, energy code. Uh, and that is of concern to us because we are perilously close to slipping below that in the fall. Uh, we will obviously take every step available to us to ensure that that does not happen. Um, but uh, that is obviously a concern going forward uh, in terms of policy this year. Uh, I want to make sure the community is aware of that so that we can take proactive steps uh, to minimize the amount of time spent below that safe harbor number. Um, so again, uh, the other component of this is the balancing the need to grow and diversify our primarily residential tax base with efforts to retain our appealing community character. We obviously need to prioritize um, commercial growth in a way that makes sense for this community uh, and is not just a reckless, uh, unchecked uh, growth for growth's sake uh, that will have unintended consequences down the line. So again, minimizing that time spent under the safe harbor, beginning a comprehensive plan um, then there's a broader community conversation about how Brookline should look uh, and feel uh, and what efforts it should take to reach those areas. Um, and again, compliance with the MBTA Communities Act at the end of the year, which has been the subject of significant discussion uh, here and elsewhere. And we continue to have that community discussion and value that as a priority to make sure that the ultimate decision uh, that is reached at town meeting for how to comply with that act represents the community, uh, but also ensures that smart, sustainable growth rather than uh, an, an, an attempt to um, uh, merely uh, uh, merely hit the uh, hit the target but not actually recognize the benefits, the potential benefits uh, of compliance with the act. Diversity, equity, and inclusion remain a significant uh, uh, priority for Brookline. 
Um, we have continued uh, our disadvantaged business enterprise outreach. Uh, I encourage contractors uh, and members of disadvantaged business communities uh, to visit workwith.brooklinema.gov. This is our so-called quality contracting platform. Uh, new contracts are posted there on a regular basis. Um, it also includes all the information necessary about how to get through the red tape and get yourself registered as a contractor um, so that you can bid on Brookline projects. Um, we're very excited to expand that functionality. Um, as you know, in order for us to be able to mandate any sort of um, 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 uh, in order to mandate any sort of uh, 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 minimum uh, DBE uh, subcontractor um, usage in town contracts, we must complete a disparity study, a highly technical document that reflects the actual disparity between non-disadvantaged and disadvantaged contractors in our communities. We hope to partner uh, with other municipalities, most notably Somerville, to make this happen, uh, and we're very grateful to them for pushing that process forward. We anticipate conducting that process beginning in earnest this year. Um, um, there's the uh, reconfiguration of uh, ODICR into ODEICR, the Office of Diversity, Equity, uh, Inclusion, and Community Relations. Again, foregrounds equity is that cardinal principle, uh, and it implements that new complaint resolution tool uh, that was passed in town meeting this fall. Um, for language access, um, we are excited. Uh, to we've hired a, um, uh, a consultant that has been conducting an in-depth needs analysis that's concluding shortly this spring. Uh, assuming a successful override, we will hope we will be able to bring a permanent position on staff and finance uh, the budget to ensure meaningful language access uh, for all residents of Brookline to town services. Uh, we're grateful in terms of pursuing transparency, access, and community engagement uh, to have our new ATA for operations position. Uh, Devin has done fantastic work bringing on uh, the monthly newsletter, and we hope to have a more frequent cadence for that newsletter in the coming year, especially if we have an additional community engagement specialist involved who can conduct outreach to make that happen. Um, we have new quarterly cross-departmental meetings that ensure greater whole of government awareness of community needs. This has been great in terms of cross-pollinating and making sure that departments uh, are able to talk to one another at a division head level uh, and figure out uh, uh, emerging needs that may require the use of the intervention from more than one department. Uh, we have moved the historic position of community engagement strategists that we formerly operated in ODICR um, to the select board office to emphasize its importance. Uh, however, that position, when filled, will still have a reporting responsibility to the ODI ECR, um, and hiring will begin this summer if the override is successful. Um, the select board um, passed its first ever code of conduct, uh, for which um, staff has been uh, incredibly grateful. Uh, it sets us community guidelines for not just staff and elected um, officials, but members of the public. Um, to ensure that there is clarity uh, in the expectations of how interactions uh, should happen, uh, what is possible and what isn't possible. Uh, it's a model, a model for other boards and communities to adopt. Uh, the select board strongly encourages uh, that it, the boards that it uh, appoints members to adopt these or similar policies and encourages those that it doesn't uh, to take a look at it as well. For social services, um, as you know, in 2021, uh, there was an attempt to, uh, to conduct uh, a, a less formal uh, needs analysis in the community. Uh, and when that process concluded at the end of this year, uh, it did not bear the results that we wanted. Um, we need to have a, fourth, a formal needs analysis and it needs to be done on an accelerated timeline, but done correctly. Uh, we need to know in this town and in this community the resources available, the dearth of those resources, and how we should most effectively structure our limited resources to provide social services effectively um, in and filling gaps that the community has identified and prioritize those things appropriately. Um, again, as previously mentioned, in ARPA round one, over 11 million out of 44 million was allocated to projects and entities that assist disadvantaged communities. The override proposal currently permanently for funds several town pilot programs that are now being paid for with ARPA that are meant to uh, increase outreach for and successful outcomes for disadvantaged communities. Um, 
I guess I previously mentioned the uh, the override proposal contains a $2.2 million regular infusion to prevent runaway degradation of streets. The CIP this year provides a full $500,000 for sidewalk repair, an increase from last year to $700,000 for bike access improvements, and $500,000 for traffic calming. We continue to evaluate on a regular basis whether federal funding from two additional laws, uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, can be used for transportation projects here. While we have not yet met with success there, we continue to be hopeful um, that particularly as money allocated to the states spins up, we might see some benefits there. We cannot obviously operate on hope as the state uh, aid problem has indicated to us. We must be realistic in what we can and can't get uh, at present when we publish a budget. Um, but that doesn't mean, that also doesn't mean we can't keep a very strong eye out on any potential grant sources of revenue. So for the American Rescue Plan Act, um, we want to talk about the round two of the community response and beyond. Uh, the select board authorized the issuance of $6 million in premium pay to current employees who worked 40 more days in person at the outset of the pandemic, that first year of the pandemic. Uh, again, those were subject to certain additional restrictions and caveats in certain cases. Most recipients got $4,000 um, less taxes. Um, some folks part-time or folks who were only working, who were only uh, employees for part of that time uh, received less. Um, but on the whole, it was a significant uh, and very well received uh, by staff. Uh, thank you uh, to those uh, uh, currently here who served uh, at, in person at one of the most dangerous times uh, in the pandemic. So um, we are very grateful to them. Uh, and we are very grateful to the select board uh, for the decision to authorize what, what is currently tied for the single largest expenditure of ARPA funding for that purpose. We understand, obviously, that in an ideal world, we would fund even further, we would be able to fund um, funds to everyone, people who retired, people who left service, we would be able to provide more money to people. But the fact of the matter is the community oriented process that the select board has prioritized must also receive meaningful amounts of funding. Um, and so this $6 million represents an appropriate balance between the other community needs uh, and the, uh, the desire to retain uh, and reward staff who served during that dangerous period. Uh, there is still, as a result, even after that premium pay has been issued, $10.5 million approximately available for round two projects. Applications for those projects closed in early February and are now being reviewed. The town, this time around, rather than submitting a, a, a menu of options and asking the committee to think about it, centralized its submissions. We asked for approval of less than $5 million out of $10.7 million in identified ARPA eligible priorities. Again, this is in keeping with the goal of ensuring that town needs uh, and needs of the community that are being provided for by the town are addressed, but also direct community engagement and direct community uh, uh, payments through ARPA funding uh, were still meaningful uh, and can have a significant impact in that regard. The committee is currently evaluating submissions in public hearings uh, that occur every other Friday. Uh, we encourage you to attend. Community Preservation Act is spinning up, uh, as you saw in the presentation last week, uh, if you joined us last week, it's very exciting that committee is doing excellent work in ensuring that uh, it will be ready uh, to accept applications for a potential in more than $6 million in available funding in the fall of this year. There are four different categories of funding support, open space, historic preservation, recreation, and affordable housing. They are currently uh, engaging with a consultant to develop a public process for this. Review of the draft plan will happen on June 12th at their uh, meeting. There'll be a public hearing June 17th, and the plan will be revised uh, on August 14th. Um, okay, uh, <laughs> now this is the point where we transition to uh, more detail in the budget. Um, I wanted to just start off by really thanking um, Charles, Charlie, Charles Young uh, for all his efforts. Um, he came in, in late in the fall and normally the assistant town administrator has the luxury of using the summer to flip the budget. Um, so he had to flip the budget and dive right into budget requests um, immediately upon starting. So a lot of this has been very compressed and I really appreciate Charlie just digging in and, and really um, helping us get the document to where it is and, and really um, mastering OpenGov, um, which has been really great to see. Uh, so this, this slide here is just a summary of our overall financial plan. So you can see our general fund revenue up top. And then um, when you add in the enterprise and revolving funds, we've got $404 million. 
um, of revenue, and then it, uh, the categories below for operating budget, not appropriated, and then obviously our CIP is um, a significant item, especially with our strong free cash certification. So you can see how the budget is balanced between revenue expenditures uh, in this slide here. So Chaz's earlier presentation had a, um, an, a pie chart that showed expenditures uh, by grouping. Um, this is an exercise that we do where we have uh, information from the end of the year report in fiscal 23, which shows expenses um, on behalf of the schools by town department. So we use that information to build into the fiscal 24 budget to project what education actually does cost the town. So um, given that information, we're at 59.5% uh, for a fully allocated fiscal 24 budget. This is a summary of the changes in the general fund. So you can see that revenue is growing by about $19 million. A big uh, portion of that is free cash. Um, and then we have our non-appropriated expenses, which get deducted off that revenue number, giving us $359 million to appropriate. So that's about a 5.5% growth, just under $19 million. And you can see um, where the allocations are going. So town departments are growing 3.5%. I will say that's a little misleading because some of that growth is attributed to providing additional resources for the building department school maintenance budget. So um, you know, about a million dollars of that is, is growth in the building department specifically for schools. Um, and then you also have your school growth of about 1.1%, which basically reflects the, that resetting um, of the building department budget. Our non-departmental is uh, primarily benefits, but then also our debt service budget and other um, non-departmental budgets. Then we have our um, water and sewer and enterprise, the overhead charges, so they, they pay for their benefits. So this shows the, the payments that are made uh, for those benefits to the town. And uh, your total appropriations are also balanced out, $359 million on the general fund. This is a snapshot of our change in local receipts. So we, you can see that the increase is just shy of $1.3 million with um, local option taxes and uh, the refuse fees com coming in as um, high contributors to local receipts. The um, local option taxes are primarily meals and hotel. Um, Still looking at marijuana um, and you know the first quarter of the year hasn't been that strong we may need to bring that down further um, based on what we see for a third quarter payment this is showing the allocation of free cash per the town's fiscal policy so 22.7 million dollars is the highest free cash certification we've had on record um, i will say that um, a huge piece of free cash is coming from a one-time payment from um, the utility company, so that um, th there's been a dispute over the assessment of personal property for utilities, and they had been withholding their uh, portion of tax payment uh, based on that. Um, they got a negative uh, decision in a separate case with Springfield, and so um, given that outcome, knowing that they likely are still accruing interest on their tax um, on their tax account, they they caught up to where they needed to be. Uh, for the years that they would withheld payments. So that was just under $7 million. So that's a one-time payment, and that's a, a huge reason why free cash is at the level that it is. But we'll take it, um, because it definitely helps support the CIP. Um, so we are looking at, um, in the prioritization of free cash, the first area that we visit is our uh, budget reserve. So 25% of our reserve fund is coming from free cash, so that's the $767,000 number. We are uh, appropriating $4.5 million into the stabilization fund, and the rest we're going to leave unappropriated, which basically will help create free cash for the following year. So those two um, numbers add up to $7.2 million. Our liability fund has a target of 1% of prior year net revenue, so to the extent that we're below that target, um, we need free cash to get us back uh, up to that level, so that requires $381,000. Uh, our CIP has a target of 7.5% of prior year net revenue, so $4.6 million is what's needed to get us to that level. Our affordable housing trust fund, the policy says that if the trust fund is below $5 million, then um, there would be an appropriation from free cash coming from there. Um, so the fund was above $5 million, so the policy is not triggered, so there's no appropriation recommended at this time. So that leaves 
uh, $9.8 million available for special use. So special use would be revisiting any of the earlier categories in the waterfall or if there are other accounts and one-time obligations um, that are um, needed for an infusion of cash. In the years past, we've put more money towards pensions. We've put more money towards OPEBs. Um, this year, we're recommending that um, we resolve the current deficit in the FEMA uh, COVID account. Um, I can assure you that our emergency management team is diligently still pursuing reimbursement through FEMA. Um, unfortunately, the rules keep changing, and um, the, the team has been trying to respond to the shifting parameters for FEMA reimbursement. And so we're hoping that at the end of this, the, the actual deficit is, is less, but it will come in later. It likely won't come in for another couple of years, and it will just um, fall to free cash when it does come in. Um, and then we're also uh, recommending additional CIP, a, just shy of $9 million for the CIP on top of the 4.6 we're already allocating, which has been such a great thing um, to be able to provide um, a real infusion to existing accounts that have had, you know, a lot of deferred fund, uh, deferred maintenance uh, issues throughout the years. So it's nice to give a little shot in the arm to the roadway account and, and to some other um, underfunded areas within the CIP. This is uh, our slide where we show our fund balance targets. So you can see that we were able to achieve above 10% per the policy of undesignated fund balance. So we're at 13.54. Um, I believe that is an anomaly given the one-time payments since we are spending most of what we got for free cash. I don't expect that to continue into 24, which is part of the reason why I'm recommending the $4.5 million appropriation into the stabilization fund so that we can try and at least keep up to the level of, that we need to do per the policy. <clears throat> this just shows our um, expenditure growth. So you can see the CIP is the largest area of growth in the budget here, followed by our benefit budget and then uh, town departments and then our school department budget as well. This shows our schedule for the pension system. So anytime um, we just had our actuarial valuation in 22, so the new schedule is set for the next two years. Um, we're still at 2030 for our funding rate. Our um, rate of return assumption was able to be lowered, which is great. And um, our, our funding schedule didn't change from the prior schedule, which is also good news. Um, our liability did drop a little bit in 22 um, due to good market returns. And, you know, we'll hope that, um, you know, the next two years are, um, you know, maybe not as, hopefully we, yeah, it may not be the same kind of market returns, but we're hoping that we're, at least don't lose too much ground um, from the change in the environment. So our OPEB plan is continuing into fiscal 24, where we're adding $250,000 annually. Um, and so we're hoping that when the pension system is funded in 2030, this big drop off here, we're hoping that will that will be appropriated into the uh, to cover the un unfunded obligation for OPEB. This is just a quick snapshot of the budget um, showing the, the uh, property tax revenue growth and then also just the other categories of expenditures like the benefit budget and um, town departments, et cetera. This is a snapshot of our water and sewer budget. So we have um, our revenue and expenses totaling 32 million 522, uh, showing the different categories. Um, so some exciting things for Aaron to talk about when the CPW budget comes in front of you as well. Our golf enterprise fund, two and a half million dollars. Um, 22 was a lot less because the US Open was in town. So now we're hoping that the riding on the coattails of a successful event, plus enthusiasm for the driving range and other amenities that the golf course has going on, that um, we'll have a, a, a good year, um, both in 23 and in 24. Then we have our Recreation Revolving Fund, also showing some rebounding from COVID, um, looking at some exciting programming, returning back to pre-pandemic levels. So we've got a budget there um, of about $4.4 million. CIP, the Capital Improvement Program, is a, another component of the financial plan. So we are looking at a $367 million CIP for the next several years, and that's approximately $61 million over the six-year plan. Uh, the major school budget is Pierce. Um, the town assumption of $173 million is based on an estimate from the project team of what we potentially could get from MSBA reimbursement. Um, so we are complying with our fiscal policies around the 6% policy and then using free cash. 
Um, but obviously being able to support the CIP with additional free cash uh, really helps us provide a really strong program for the upcoming year. So this is just a summary of the components of the free cash, um, how we get to prior year net revenue, what the allocation is between our net uh, debt finance uh, CIP, so those are bond funded uh, pro programs, and then our revenue financed, which is cash funded programs and then the debt exclusions get added on top of that for the total picture. These are some of the major project, projects that we have in the CIP. Um, was really happy that I was able to find some capacity in the out years where the Davis Path Bridge was able to get pulled forward. Um, so we've got that programmed in for fiscal 27. Um, we'll still look to provide grant opportunities to maybe reduce that number, but um, it's nice to see it uh, out of the future years column in the, in the plan. Uh, ongoing work continues at Lars Anderson. Um, we do have some classroom capacity money continuing, although a lesser degree than in years past, especially in the out years. Um, we have uh, some transportation work coming online, uh, most notably the Washington Street Project, the Complete Streets Program. That's a major partnership with the state um, looking for um, to get on the TIP, the transportation plan for the state, and that's about a $26 million um, state match. Then we have our Schick Playground coming in at 24, and then we also have um, funding for the equipment for body-worn and in-car in camera programs. So we're currently in the midst of our um, bargaining cycle with the police department, but we, we can fund the equipment, and when we're ready to execute, it'll, this account will be available for us to implement. Then we have our long-range financial plan that we also um, kind of take some of the assumptions and refine them as the year goes through and um, project that out for the out year so you can see kind of the outlook uh, beyond fiscal 24. Um, knowing that, um, you know, there's definitely some, some pressure around schools and, and the override may help ease that pressure, um, but the, the fiscal 25 de deficit does start at about $13 million and it does escalate to about $31.8 million to total town-wide. Um, and that is, um, essentially showing that we have revenues growing on average by 3% and our expenditures are growing around 5%. Um, this slide here is a blizzard of numbers. Um, all of this information is gonna be posted on the town's website and included in the financial plan for people to look at afterwards. This just shows the summary of the uh, forecast for the out years. This drop here is really just um, kind of returning free cash to our, uh, our normal policy levels. Um, and you can see the, the growing deficit in the out years. Um, but knowing that if you once you resolve the $13 million deficit, it's not going to roll into 26, so it's a little overstated. Um, and then this is just a graph that shows that deficit as it grows. Uh, the 25, obviously, is the change in the free cash number, but you can see that there's still uh, a significant gap between revenue and expenditures here. So that is the end of the presentation, and I think we've got some time for um, questions from the board. Well, Bernard, you're on mute. Bernard, I can't hear you. I saw Miriam's hand go up first, so why don't you start, and I'll let other people speak before I say my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you everyone for such an amazing job. It's it, uh, for those that don't know, it's really a huge volume of work. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, on the slide where you're talking about the affordable housing trust fund, I, I realized that we didn't trigger putting more money into the affordable housing trust fund, but I just wonder if there was any discussion about still putting some of that money. I mean, I realize you want to give as much as you can to the CIP, but even, a, you know, to me, we talk so much about affordable housing. It's such a priority. I under, I totally understand the tension between all the different priorities, but we're right at 5 million is my understanding, right? So maybe we could put a little in there, but I just want to put that on there to see what the discussion was around that. Sure. I, I think, you know, given um, the, the support from both ARPA and through the Community Preservation Fund, I think we were looking for more direction from the board on whether or not the policy needed to be changed or whether or not, um, you know, you felt comfortable with where it is. Um, in years past, we have put additional um, free cash towards affordable housing, even when the policy wasn't tr triggered. 
Um, so we can continue to look at that and maybe revise before we get to the town meeting. Okay, um, I think Mike was next. Is that? Uh, maybe John, go ahead. John. John, okay, sorry. Thank you. So, oh boy, there's so much here. Uh, I'll echo Miriam's um, appreciation of how much work goes into this. Uh, it is quite amazing. Um, and I, I find um, whenever we go through this process that the only way I can really kind of get my arms around what, what's in front of us is to start with some fundamental questions and answers. And the one that I'm gonna start with is um, <clears throat> what does this, <clears throat> excuse me, this uh, budget represent in terms of uh, FTEs, uh, full-time full equivalent positions? Um, and I, I, I know the answer to the question, um, at least insofar as it's all there. Um, and in fact, it, it shows that there is an increase in full-time equivalent positions um, over, <clears throat> excuse me, not over the, not just over the prior year, a slight increase, but then a dramatic increase if you look back to, um, let's say FY19, which is pre-COVID, <clears throat> we're, we're up um, some, some 14 positions from FY19. So um, I'd love to have a narrative, and I wonder if, if we could get one, in the near future that would explain the additional 14 positions since FY19 um, in a narrative um, so that, you know, when people ask us, is the override because just to pay for the positions we already have requires more money or is it because we're adding positions? Sure, um, I will say that Section two of our interactive budget does include a table by department. So you can see where the growth is by department, right. but we can give you the specific positions associated with that growth. That's no problem. But as I'm, as I say, a narrative as to why we needed to add those positions is, is what I'm looking for. Th and thanks for the answer. <coughs> Mike. Uh, two things. <laughs> Uh, one is a very is a very general comment, and the other is a more specific one. Um, one of the things I think would be helpful, um, perhaps to us, but also I think to the public, um, is to get a sense of uh, how much, um, for lack of a better term, discretionary money we have. We have a three hundred fifty six million dollar budget, uh, but eighty or uh, something over eighty, between eighty and and eighty five percent of that is uh, personnel. Uh, a lot of it, a very substantial amount of it is by contract and there's you know where we're that th those are essentially fixed expenses even though an economist would tell you that employees are never a fixed expense that ain't so um and um uh, if you work out the numbers as i have in the pa in past years we typically end up with somewhere around uh eight percent of the budget being actually flexible for those new initiatives and so forth so that's a, a general comment that I think would be helpful to put in somewhere, uh, somewhere in the presentation, maybe get it close to the top. Um, the second one is a much more specific one. Uh, you mentioned um, at, uh, the health department and the need to assess community needs. Um, and the community foundation, Brookline Community Foundation is right on the edge of uh, issuing a report or updating a report that it put out, I think about 10 years ago on uh, Brookline and it does a did at that time a very fine job of describing where needs were and uh, to the extent that we can partner make use of some of the work that they've done um, save some time and money i think uh, that would be very very just a very good idea so to the extent that Segal can uh, talk with uh, abba taylor over in, in um, the community foundation uh, i think that would be helpful to probably to both sides indeed i think that conversation is, is ongoing this week um so okay. Yeah. Good. Um, so I, I'd like to add to that. I, I agree that uh, we, we need to look at the data that has already been um, accumulated through VCF and other places. Uh, one thing that <laughs> that I noticed in the um, in in the financial plan is the tension between 
the uh, social service needs that were created or revealed by the pandemic. And, um, you know, the limitations and restrictions of a town government. I mean, you mentioned that, you know, the, uh, the, these needs were formally uh, taken up by federal and state agencies who have abdicated their responsibility and it's left on us. Uh, that sort of puts us in a terrible situation. And I think this, the solution is to make, to, to, uh, make sure that we have identified, you know, what our actual needs are and um, be careful about creating structures that um, you know, may not be appropriate for a small municipality like we are, uh, you know, without the benefits of economies of scale, for example, um, and, and other benefits of larger, uh, uh, um, larger entities. So I think you know, one, one thing that um, I hope that uh, the, the um, research by Sigal comes up with is, is a, um, a sense of what our budget for social services are um, so that you know, we, we, we um, identify what we are doing and can identify where uh, there's a need for uh, more expenditure, um, you know, more, more ideas, et cetera. So. Uh, Miriam? Thank you, Bernard. Just to, to echo what you said, and you said created what the pandemic created or revealed, but I would I would venture to say this is a both and situation. The pandemic both created the need for greater social services and revealed a, a need in the community that had not really been appreciated prior to. Um, and I think it's important for us as a community because I think everyone is right, right? This stuff is now on our plate and we have, I think, an obligation morally as well as as a municipality to, to do something. I, I, I think being very thoughtful about what we do is important. I just appreciate, I guess what I wanna say is I appreciate that we all see we need to act. That, that not doing something doesn't appear to be an option. We really need to figure out a way to support our residents um, in this vacuum left by the Fed, federal and state uh, government. So I thank you for that. Okay. Um, any other uh, comments, questions? Let's see, let me look through my notes. What do I have? Um, okay, uh, John. Just a question about the um, number as to the state reimbursement on the, the MSBA, um, Massachusetts School Building Authority um, reimbursement on the Pierce Project. Uh, it By my math, it works out to 17.6% uh, of the total cost of the project. Is that within the range of what communities can usually expect to get from the MSBA on a on a school project? I, I think it varies. I think it depends on um, you know the. I, there's definitely been you know communities that, that are maybe in more distress that have received a higher level of reimbursement. Um, but I, I would think that this is probably on the low end of what they typically offer. I seem to recall that. Um, there were discussions that it would be in the range of 35 to 40 percent. Um, so I'm get, I, it, it sounds to me as though uh, we didn't quite achieve what we had hoped to achieve through that reimbursement process, but that's just a comment. I, I wasn't expecting you to, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, to say anything in response, but thank you for that answer. I think too, right, the, the formula that they use has not really been adjusted appropriately for the increased costs that we've experienced in the pandemic and inflation. Um, it just, it lags. Um, MSBA is not, um, it's not, it's not taking into account how expensive it is to build here. Um, and that is a complaint that many other communities have raised as well, is that um, there's not enough money in MSBA to begin with and that they're not evaluating, evaluating the actual costs in a way that allows for meaningful assistance to communities. Yeah, I think to add to that, um, you know, you can't, it's really not apples to apples when you compare Brookline and the Pierce project to other communities. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, uh, pieces to this that MSBA can't, uh, can't um, reimburse. 
that are related to the fact of where it is and what we're trying to do to not um, you know, eliminate uh, the town garage and to sort of wedge in between the library and the health department, et cetera. So, I mean, we, we, got, a, we, got, we got a good reimbursement rate here. Well, um, Bernard, you would agree with me that during the process of planning this, what was presented to the community was that we could expect 35 to 40% reimbursement from MSBA, right? Uh, that, we that, same was a, that was a rough guess. I'm not sure that you know we were saying that this is the exact amount that we expect. I hope we didn't say that. Okay. Um, would, it, would it be okay if I could just make a comment uh, that, sure. that's on, on a different topic altogether? Because um, I, I do think it, that um, uh, Chaz and Melissa and, and others um, might uh, might appreciate some guidance from all of us here on the select board as to kind of how we set the parameters of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, what we think should guide our budget planning um, in the post-COVID um, period of time. And thankfully, there will be a post-COVID period of time. Um, I, I I know I've heard in the news not, you know, not long ago that uh, it's possible that President Biden will make some sort of official declaration uh, of the end of the national um, COVID uh, emergency sometime in May. So, you know, that's one indication that we, we're, we're entering a post-COVID period. Um, and <clears throat> I, I think we can go back to that phrase that our prior town administrator used uh, you know, a new normal, but what is our new normal? You know, is our new normal that we should expect to have to staff up with more positions than we had pre-COVID um, on a permanent basis? And will those positions continue to grow in number? Um, because this all comes down to payrolls. I think if we took a look at this budget as a totality, um, and pulled out what is salaries, payroll, in the budget. Melissa, correct me if I'm wrong, it'd probably come out to about 80%, right? So it does come down to salaries, and it does come down to the tension between our ability to raise revenue over and above 2.5% a year, um, and it does come down to um, if we struggle just to maintain um, positions, given the restrictions on our revenue, um, then to what extent you know, do we allow ourselves and are we compelled to add positions? Because um, we've been adding positions. I mentioned you know, since uh, FY19, um, an addition of 14 positions. Um, since FY15, it, it looks to me like an addition of 35 positions. So is our expectation going into the future that we're going to maintain all of the positions we've added um, and add to that? Or is it that we have kind of reached peak positions? I don't know. I just think these are the questions that um, we as individuals on the select board and the select board collectively has to take on. Yeah, uh, Mike? Uh, it, John, you raise, a, it, it, you raise a very apt point, and so I think it's a reasonable thing to say that if you look at the positions that have been added, they've been added in response to um, somewhere between requests and demands from the public for new services. Uh, and I think that that pretty much uh, is true for all of the positions, even to the, to the point of adding a, a, a you know, our requesting and the public requesting better data analysis uh, in the uh, in the select board's office. So um, the, it's not like we have a, a staff that's run wild uh, out there hiring people. Um, there's uh, a great deal of, of pressure for um, adding people from uh, residents who want uh, want those certain want the services that we have extended for new services and so forth. Um, the rat, uh, the rodent control uh, question is just, it, it's a perfect example. We're, we're adding, I think, one or one and a half uh, FTEs in response to that. It's a real problem. It's a real issue. People are genuinely concerned about it and they have a right to be. It takes people uh, in addition to what we, uh, what we have on staff 
in order to manage it. And if you go back and look at the 14 positions that you identify, I'll bet that um, almost all of them are, are related to that kind of uh, demand from uh, from residents. Yeah, I'd like to add that um, in, ad in addition, um, Brooklyn has been operating as sort of a small government model on a small government model. So a lot of the demand, it really reflects the fact that for many years we've under under maintained our, our staffing uh, in, in many departments. So I mean, that, that doesn't mean we, we don't look at, you know, the increase in, in uh, staffing um, very carefully, but, you know, we are catching up to some degree uh, mm -hmm. and we have been ever since I've been on this select board. Miriam, you have your hand up. I, I was actually going to echo that. I was going to say two things. I think that um, I was surprised, like, for instance, that we didn't have a communications person in the select board's office to do PR and press releases and market. I mean, you know, that that's something I think most government offices have. So I, I agree with what Bernard said. I think coming in, I, I was surprised at how small kind of the operations were. But also, I think that there are things that are not ever, you know, there are changes that that the pandemic has instituted that, no, they're not going to go away. And, and I think within that whole structure, again, we're talking about how the federal and state governments see themselves and the responsibilities that now fall on us. No, I don't think those are going to go away. And I think we need and should plan for those. And I think it's a legitimate thing to point out and a legitimate question to ask, but I don't think we are operating in excess in terms of staff, right? So those positions are important positions. I don't think they're they're uh, uh, superfluous. Okay, John, did you you still have your hand up? Yeah, well, yeah, I, I raised it again. Again, oh. um, you know, if if we're going to say that this is what the public has um, has asked for, I think you know it behooves us to. Be a little bit more specific. What what did we hear the public say um, that that brought about you know additions to the budget with our consent? Um, I hear the public, and I, I've you know I've heard town meetings say we need to do a better job with um, language services. But um, you know, in the thirty five positions that were added, I I don't find that the position that we need to add to do a better job with language services. I think we are going to add that um, in the near future. Um, I, I don't really recall with any specificity demands that would explain uh, the addition of 35 positions. And um, to take the example of the rodent control, which I, I think is a, a good example of a very urgent problem that demands additions to our staffing, um, but does it demand permanent additions to our staffing? I mean, have we bought into the notion that we're going to have a rat problem forever? Or, or weren't we sort of um, assuming that a rat problem, we didn't have it be before to the extent that we have it now, and that it's uh, some kind of a, you know, it's based on some kind of specific sequence of events that caused there to be an explosion in the populations of rats, but that if we come up with effective measures, we'll eventually get this back to a more normal situation. And I'm not sure that that would justify permanent addition of uh, staffing to deal forever with rats. Um, if we ever have to deal with them again, we'll add staffing again, I guess. John, I'm, I'm sorry, Mike. Yeah, I, that's a, a really good, uh, it, it's a really good question. I think that there are some positions that um, we could look at as being there's a three-year or five-year uh, term, and then we should take another look and see whether uh, that position continues to be necessary. There is a tendency to want to take someone who is whose position has um, uh, ha ha has, is perhaps no longer as important um, or whose job is no longer as important as it was, and since we have an employee in hand, uh, ask them to do something else with it. So I recognize that. With regard to the rat, pro uh, the rat situation, we have had a fundamental change in that we have outdoor dining in a way that we've never had before. And that takes um, constant vigilance really to make sure that uh, establishments are cleaning up, uh, are handling their, their garbage correctly and so forth. Uh, and um, 
I think that's something that probably will persist for a very long time. Uh, so there are some of these things, yes, you're absolutely right. And we should be looking to make sure that, um, and perhaps when they're originally, when the original hire is made, setting them up so that there's a discrete period of funding and then the position's reevaluated. And there are some that are just, you know, there are long-term needs that are identified and they, they need to be continued. I think Miriam's comment about um, someone to do communications in the select board office is really right on the market, uh, right on the mark, because uh, we see so much on the town meeting uh, member listserv. And I've seen, um, and we have so little ability uh, because of uh, open meeting law to, um, to, rep to respond to it uh, in, um, and, and really contribute to a debate. Um, and in contrast, I look at what the city of Newton puts out, uh, which is a weekly newsletter from uh, the mayor that um, large numbers of the public actually read, they value. Uh, and I know that because I have two daughters who live in Newton uh, and they say, oh yeah, we read that. We think it's very, very helpful. Uh, we don't have anything like that. And uh, uh, so there are certainly situations where we're missing something that we could add if we had the funding and the addition does indeed become permanent. So uh, do we do we have a, a list of um, of John's uh, 34 or whatever the number was positions that we could actually look at and or assess? Yeah, we'll provide something for the board packet. Okay. So it may, maybe it's difficult to to come up with that list, but you know anything that we can look at to every year the change in FTE is voted on by town meeting. These are these are um, enhancements to town services that. Every year we talk about, and we can just itemize them by fiscal year. Yeah, good. Thank you, uh, John. Your hand again. Yeah, thanks. Um, I didn't actually mention the specific numbers, and I was feeling a little bit um, like we're leaving people in the dark. So fiscal year um, <clears throat> fifteen, six hundred and seventy-six total employees, um, and uh, the current budget that's in front of us, um, seven hundred and fourteen employees. So that's where I get my number from. It's more like an increase in the range of 35 to 40. Um, and I also wanted to put those numbers out there because when I hear this talk of, we're just a small town and you know, we don't have that many people and we're always short of people. It's, you know, come on, it's a pretty big budget. Well, you know, but, but, but talk to people in the departments and-, and I know, I know. Nobody well, that's ever feels like, that they have enough. 5,000 people. Those are town services for- 65,000 people. It's I mean, absolutely I, true. It's absolutely, I'm not, I'm not quarreling with it at all. I'm just saying, let's not, yeah. you know. Well, that, that, that's, that's my way of looking at a lot of problems that have sort of rose up over the years. And, you know, just saying, you know, just, I, that's a shorthand of saying, you know, we have a problem that we need to think about and see how big it is. And that shorthand is to say, we operate on a small government uh, model. Um, and yeah, you know, that that's what I hear, <laughs> and that's what I see when when we try to solve problems. But you know, that may not uh, be the full story. So, um, Jazz. Yeah, I just want to add a, a layer a layer to this that I think is always interesting and kind of enlightening. Um, the question of the degree of services, temporary versus permanent services, uh, and when considering whether or not to hire contractors versus employ new employees, even on a temporary basis. Um, there are such pros and cons to both and depending on the community's needs. But I think when you look at some of the things, for example, the tree program in the override proposal, um, you know, that's three FTEs, that's a lot. It's a lot of new potential bodies to bring on, new benefits to look in. But when you look at the cost since FY04, when $125,000 could buy you more than a year of contractor services, now it buys you less than 15 weeks. Um, you know, in, in instances like that, it's clear that the town doing it rather than hiring it out provides benefits. There are also things that the town does that I think Brookline has as a potential strength that other communities lack. Um, one of those things is in the building department, um, project and program management. Um, oftentimes in other communities, they will just hire contractors to do that, uh, hire um, outside project managers, uh, pay them, you know, exorbitant project management rates uh, to handle their capital projects. 
Um, we typically don't do that. Um, we have internal project managers. Um, we have for some time uh, who have all been excellent. And a big part of that building department restructuring is because a lot of those people are now reaching the end of their careers and are deciding to retire. And we want to make sure that we preserve that capacity because I view that capacity as one of Brookline's real strengths. And it is such an intrinsic good that I think other communities, just by virtue of the fact that they don't do it, uh, don't realize. Um, there's a lot of nuance when it comes to the provision of certain services that we do that other communities don't, um, that we should uh, evaluate through that lens, uh, which is important. That's not every service. And I think another you know big aspect of this, Bernard, that you're alluding to is that we've been in this very reactive mode in the pandemic. Um, we have really put a uh, 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 we put our emergency hats on and said, we're getting through this. Um, and to John's point, um, this is kind of the turning budget, right? This is a budget that still reflects that mentality from prior years, but also makes a concrete step towards an environment in which COVID, COVID response is not the top line and top of mind uh, in every environment. And so I think using this year as an opportunity to maintain continuity of services while also analyzing, especially as we look at FY25 with the possibility of additional override funds, um, the highest and best use of that, uh, of, of uh, the, the, the budget for the community. Um, it, it, is, it is something that I think staff values, that kind of guidance looking at the um, the future uh, in an environment where we are not just trying to keep our heads down and make sure that you know candidly everyone stays alive, right? So that's that's where we are, and I think this is a good year to start having those discussions with the idea that the rem hopefully the remainder of you know the next several fiscal years, really the remainder of the decade as we move toward 2030 and the the full funding of the um, pension, um, we start thinking about what the broader sort of um, uh, big question, big big ticket priority items are. Uh, Miriam, I see your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Bernard. Um, I, I'm going to just put my public health hat on here for a second too, and I'm going to say a few things pandemic related. And the first is th that there's never, I mean, I hate to break the news to you, there's never going to be a real post pandemic, right? Th this is going to be endemic. We are always going to have some variations in COVID transmission throughout the season, throughout the years. And I think we are yet to really understand the long-term impacts of COVID, both in terms of mental health impacts on, on our kids and in terms of long COVID, which is really a very, still very poorly understood uh, post-COVID sequelae. The second thing I'll say is some things like rats, I think is, it is important to notice there was a rat problem before COVID. It mostly affected individuals who didn't have a lot of power or voice, but it was there. And the thing that COVID did, which was bring out all this outdoor dining, that is not going away. And actually, I don't want it to go away. I love outdoor dining in the summertime. It's one of my new favorite things. But that means the rat problem is also not just going to disappear. Um, so I think I, I think we need to think about that COVID is here in a way it has changed how we think and how we act, and the long term impacts are yet to be realized. Which is also why I think it's so important we think about social service, a Department of Social Services, because we still don't really, frankly, know what it's going to look like a few years from now. So that's my my public health bit on that. And, and since I'm talking about public health, just everybody make sure you're boosted. Okay, that's it, bye. Yeah, I'm boosted and I still got the common cold. Right, and that's still around. And, and that's the coronavirus too. <laughs> yes. The flu vid, I'm telling you, next year it's gonna be a combo COVID flu booster and it's gonna be called the flu vid. Okay. I should patent that. Yeah, um, Mike, Mike. One thing I, I, I do think is worth pointing out um, uh, is scale. Uh, that is, uh, the population of Brookline has increased in the period that we're talking about, an increase of 30, 30 35 uh, uh, town employees. That's about a 5% increase in employment. The population has increased somewhere between 8 and 10%. So 
more people, I mean, the fact of the matter is you need more, uh, um, more staff to service more people. Um, and if the, you know, if the percentage of increase in population is higher than the percentage in increase in employment, you're achieving more scale with what you have. Um, so it's not something to the, that number isn't something to look at in isolation, even as we have added services. Um, but if you were to take the services aspect out of it, the additional services aspect out of it uh, completely, uh, from a scale perspective, uh, we're not doing that badly. Uh, John? Yeah, I just want to reintroduce a term that um, I, I, it underlies this discussion, but I haven't really heard it used all that much. I heard it used a couple of times, and that is structural deficit. So um, I know my understanding of structural deficit is uh, that there is going to be a shortfall between revenues and expenditures just to continue with the positions from the prior year's budget. Is that everybody's understanding of structural? Because if it is, then I don't think, you know, we can say that we need these overrides because of a structural deficit. Um, if in fact we need the overrides because the budget has grown by 35 to 40 positions. Um, so I think we got to get that clear or, or we're going to have a, we're going to have a credibility problem um, is, is my concern. Okay, I'll let's let Mike re react first. Right, so so okay, that, that, John, the 35 positions uh, equates to about three and a half million dollars. Uh, if, you, if you think about it in those terms and look at the total increase in the budget, it's vastly more than three and a half million dollars. It's because the cost of everything, including people, has gone up. Um, if you were to take that three and a half million dollars out of the projected uh, 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 um, uh, deficit that's built into the, the budget, you would still have it. And it would still be greater than, substantially greater. The, the gap is still going to be substantially greater than that 35 million, that, that uh, 3.5 million. But you'd agree with yes. me that's not the definition of structural. Well, you have a structural deficit if expenditures, broadly speaking, for the base are going up faster than revenue. And that is the case. And so if you, as I say, if you take the three and a half million dollars out, you still have a deficit growing year by year. And therefore, there is indeed a structural deficit. A deficit and I would just into add that a major, of driver of, a, a major driver of the structural deficit is the growth in our what we call our budget busters. Our group health is growing at 8%, and our pension, our pension funding is growing by 7.85% annually. And that's compared to our revenue growth of around 3%. So that those are our big pressures on the budget that drive the structural deficit as well. And, and there's another structure, there's another element that drives it, and that is that we're building schools, we're building, cap, we're, we're investing in, in capital projects that cost money, and each one costs more money than the last. Okay. And, yeah. you know, that those interest rates and that amortization gets added in as well. So um, it's to, to identify an increase, a, 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 a an increase in employment as the cause of the problem, that, that's just, okay. that's not, let's, I, let's I, it's not good economics, it's not good economics. Okay, we, we're going to lose Chaz and Melissa shortly. So <laughs> yeah. let's, uh, all right, uh, Miriam and then uh, John. Uh, John. I, I would just point out that I think, John, you're conflating two different issues. A structural definite deficit is exactly what has been said by Melissa and Mike and others. It's when your revenues and your uh, expenditures don't match, period. There's nothing in the definition of a structural deficit that talks about what those revenues and those expenditures are. Those are separate issues. Yeah, and if your, town growth is, if your town growth is 8% and your growth of your municipal ability uh, uh, staff to provide is 5%, then you are actually still increasing your growth of provi provisions at a lower rate than need. Uh, and you still have a structural deficit you actually have the opposite problem. Okay, John. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad that Melissa mentioned um, pensions and um, health health care. Um, those are payroll related expenses, and um, I'm I, I'm I, I'm glad that my fellow select board members live in a world where you don't need to worry about 
adding 35 positions to your budget because um, it's a trivial addition to the budget. It's it all comes. It's 80 percent of of our budgets is payroll. And if we don't watch the payrolls, I don't know how we're ever going to sort of close the uh, the the, so the structural uh, deficit in in the budget. And uh, you know, it is true that there will be a gap um, e even if we didn't add positions. But that might actually be an argument to be very careful about adding positions. So um, maybe we just have a different worldview on these issues. Well, no, I, I think that this, when we say structural deficit, it's a structure that the uh, voters have set in place to to prevent us from uh, expanding unless we go to the voters and, and ask for uh, you know, overrides. Um, yeah, anyway, go um, that's a mischar. I'm sorry. That's a mischaracterization of what we're saying. That, that's that that's that's inappropriate. Well, right? I mean, in the I, sense that it, it was there, intended but, to be, it was intended to keep us to keep uh, you know, municipalities from from expanding and and uh, hiring more workers and and doing other things. I just think the the fact that we we are not in fact trivializing it. So I think that's the part that's the mischaracterization. But Mike, you can correct me if I'm. Yeah. No. Okay. Anything else? Are we going to talk about process? I think that was on the agenda. Yeah, that's that was, right. that was that was my hope that we could discuss we that them? and I have to jump. Them. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to run to advisory, but um, just to give you a little bit of time, Chaz, and then uh, I'll let them know. Thank you. Yeah, I think they they noticed us for seven fifteen, so I feel like we got I got I got a runway. Uh, hopefully. Thank you, Melissa. Um. Okay, um, so I wanted to share a memo that was circulated to the select board. I don't, I wasn't, I apologize if this didn't make it in the packet. Obviously, I'll make sure it is in the packet for next week. Um, folks can obviously see it. It's a draft uh, memorandum to department heads um, with specific questions uh, and guidance for them on what to do. A schedule has already been circulated to you. The department heads are, working feverishly to make sure that we are all ready uh, for the discussions about individual department budgets uh, and priorities and so forth. But um, just to name the kind of parameters and then the questions that we have developed based on conversations with all of you. Um, we, 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 the, the big takeaway is obviously that the advisory committee does these very deep dives into uh, the budgets. They are uh, through the subcommittees and the full uh, advisory committee. Um, they are the responsible entity for presenting the budget in May uh, to town meeting. Um, the select board's role is one of oversight, uh, oversight of town departments and the development of the budget. Uh, advisory's role is the presentment of the budget to town meeting. Um, so in that regard, you can see that, you know, um, you know, we don't want the, the language here just that we don't want our oversights to be duplicative of the um, advisory committees. Um, so accordingly, you know, we asked you know the, them to pr make presentations that need not last longer than ten minutes, more than ten slides, um, uh, in order to encourage conciseness uh, and ensure that you get the highlights uh, of what department heads want to present to you uh, about the importance of their efforts in the coming fiscal year. The questions that we've identified for them to answer are: What were your three biggest accomplishments last fiscal year? What metrics did you use to measure your success? We are particularly interested in ensuring uh, that we continue to analyze things based on outcome. Um, Outcome-based metrics are very important. Um, what are your three key goals for this fiscal year? And again, what metrics will you use to determine how those goals are met? Are there new initiatives that you'd like to pursue or are planning to pursue within your current budget, which is within this no override budget? Um, are, are you planning on adding or subtracting personnel? Um, if adding, what will new personnel do? If subtracting, what's the reason for doing so? Um, and um, a question that was asked last year, um, and I think several departments uh, appreciated because uh, it was an opportunity to talk uh, more generally about priorities outside of the <coughs> context, which is if you weren't constrained by current budgetary limitations, would your priorities change uh, and how? Uh, this is the effective, you know, if I gave you a million dollars, what would you do with it question? Uh, or if I gave you $10 million, what would you do with it question? Um, and I think that's always an important question for departments to be to have because it allows them to think through, um, you know, uh, priorities decoupled from uh, scarcity, which I think the community should should hear. Um, I welcome obviously comments from the board 
uh, about these potential uh, uh, asks and um, whether they think that anything additional should be in there um, or they uh, or other comments you might have. I mean, I like it. Uh, one of the things it does is it helps us to identify uh, those areas where we are, you know, understaffing or or underserving uh, the public. Um, so, let's see. Uh, Mike, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I think I'd like to stretch one of those questions. What are your three key goals for this fiscal year? What metrics will you use? I, I'd like to ask people to take a look, really, this year and then five years out. Uh, there's a tendency when you talk about this year to say, well, I want to add this position or I want to do this particular thing. But let's see if we can get people to look up a little bit more at the horizon uh, and, and think about where they want their departments to be uh, in five years out. Yeah, good. Thanks. Um, I don't see any other hands raised. Does that mean we're satisfied? And Devin just informed me. Thank you, Devin. That this is indeed in the packet. I just I clicked on the agenda item, and I'm yeah. I'm 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 glad it was. Thank you, Devin. Sorry about that. Um, I like this approach, especially insofar as it um, avoids uh, requiring the department heads and the division heads to, you know, make the same presentation over and over and over again. I think we we owe it to them to as much as possible uh, coordinate how we do these budget reviews um, so that it's not, you know, we're not siloed from each other, select board and the advisory committee and our budget reviews. I'm, <laughs> I don't mean to rush people, but I'm looking forward to um, tuning into the advisory committee's review of the, of the budget presentation tonight. Okay, let's move on then. Uh, yeah. So uh, are you, are you, maybe you, if you want to take just a vote to uh, uh, authorize me to send this out to the, uh, to the, um, uh, the department heads, I'd appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, I was thinking that uh, it'd be good to see, hear what uh, people say about it, but I, I think, you know, it, we need to get this out. Okay. I'm happy to move it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it is moved. All in favor? Uh, John? Aye. Um, Miriam? Aye. Mike? Aye. And Chair votes aye. Thank Great. you very much. I will send this out tonight, uh, yeah. and I wish you all very well, and, and you are in capable hands with uh, uh, the team here. Uh, I will go to advisory, and I will uh, see you on the other side. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next, uh, we have the uh, PACE program discussion. Is that, uh, who's doing this? Is that uh, Lincoln? Yes. Okay. So, uh, good evening. Tell us, what, tell us what it is. Yes. What you want us to do about it? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Green. So, good evening, uh, Lincoln Heineman. I'm the town's finance director, and I recognize that uh, folks want to go join the advisory committee meeting. So, I'll attempt to be concise. Um, what uh, you, you have? There's a memo in the in your packet, and and also a brief slide deck. Uh, what the PACE program is is the Property Assessed Clean Energy Program. And uh, it is a program through Mass Development, uh, the Massachusetts, uh, a Massachusetts State Agency, independent state agency. And what uh, the PACE Act does, what the um, state law allows, is that pri private property owners um, of non-residential properties, um, either for-profit or non-profit, and residential properties with five or more units, uh, the PACE program allows them to access a different financing stream for um, upfront energy improvements and energy efficiency uh, projects. And the way that the program does that is rather than um, uh, potential projects and, and the owners of those potential projects going out to um, the private financing market to access funds, uh, they, they would still be going out to the private uh, financing uh, market However, the payments back on the financing that uh, pr property owners uh, might be able to, uh, to receive is paid back through a betterment on their taxes. So to the town, and then the town would act as a pass-through, paying back through to Mass Development's paying agent, who would then pay the originator of the loans, of the financing 
for, um, for these amounts that were borrowed by the property owner. The, uh, as I said, it's, it, it's, it would take the form of a betterment. Um, it uh, would, um, in addition, the betterment, as all betterments do, would travel with the property rather than the owner. So for example, if, if the property owner sold that property, those, the, um, that betterment would stay with the property and those payments would continue through to the town and, then, and thence to the um, original financer of the loan. Um, the, so the PACE program has been uh, in, in place in Massachusetts since, since 2020. Back in uh, August of 2022, um, the legislature actually uh, passed uh, some amendments to it, which um, allow for um, it, 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 it allow it for it to, to be very specific that not just energy efficiency projects but renewable energy projects may also um, be financed through this financing structure the PACE financing structure, and that in addition, new construction and not just improvements to existing construction um, can be financed through this. Uh, I actually learned uh, in working with uh, on this project and bringing it before the board um, uh, closely with uh, Director of Planning and Community Development, Kara Bruton, uh, also Town Council, Joe Callanan, sustainability and uh, Sustainability Director, Thomas Barrasso. It actually came to my attention from David Lascoye, who uh, is a town meeting member, I think folks know, and a member of the Community Preservation Committee. Um, that's how I first learned uh, about this project, uh, this um, PACE program, uh, which I'm, I'm certainly appreciative of. So it has been adopted. So it, we're not uh, you know, a new mover in this. It has been adopted by 63 municipalities already in Massachusetts. And if the select board um, chose to approve this, this program, uh, what uh, myself and Joe and Kara would request is that um, the board allow for and, and give the authority to the town administrator, to Chaz, to um, sign whatever agreements he sees fit with mass development to effectuate this. <coughs> so, that is the high level. Obviously, happy to take any questions um, that board members have. Any questions? Seems straightforward to me. Miriam. Uh, I looked at the PowerPoint in the packet. Thank you very much. And I couldn't see any downsides. So I'm just wondering if I'm missing something. Is there is there any reason? I mean, I'm in support of this to be clear, but just I always like to know what the downsides might be, even though very clearly the upsides in this are, are significant? You know, I, I think, um, no, I, I, I don't think so. I think staff, uh, and, you know, my, myself and Kara in particular and, and Thomas, um, <clears throat> it, it isn't, while it has been adopted by 63 municipalities in Massachusetts, it has not actually um, been effectuated. There have not been a huge amount of loans given. That said, uh, the program's only been in place for two, you know, for two and a half years. Um, I did have a reached out to Village Bank, which is one of the our local lenders, um, which does this this project this program. Um, they have not yet uh, issued a loan, but they're really excited about it. They'd be excited to participate in Brookline if um, if the town adopted it. Uh, and I also reached out to uh, Brookline Bank, which obviously all of us know. And uh, you know, I think if the town did adopt this, I would hope um, that they might take a look at it and see if they're interested in it. But um, no, if uh, you know, if the agreements are in place in such a way um, that uh, you know that it makes sense to town council and to the town administrator, I really don't see any downside. A uh, question in the, um, I guess it's a chat box or some somewhere. Um, how is PACE financing applied to condominiums where multiple mortgage holders are involved? Right, so, so this would only be for residential properties with five or more units. So if each of those condominium units, which would typically be the case, are, are individual, um, uh, you know, are, are individual parcels, according to the assessor's office, according to the Norfolk County Registry of Deeds, that would not be eligible for the program. <laughs> John, you had your hand up. Yeah, thanks very much. 
I, I think Miriam asked a very good question. Um, and um, Lincoln, I, 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 I hope I have not um, conflated uh, this PACE program with what I see written about PACE programs in other states. Um, is, is Massachusetts kind of uniquely positioned to have anticipated and um, in advance the problems other states have had with the PACE program? Because the, the problems that have arisen in other states um, are pretty serious. They involve you know, when you incentivize people to borrow money to do uh, very worthy improvements to their home, energy, efficient energy related uh, improvements, um, it attracts contractors into the, you know, business, some of whom are good and some of whom aren't so good. And if the homeowners don't have a, you know, a, a clear path towards evaluating the good ones from the bad, <laughs> you can basically end up incentivizing um, problems for homeowners with bad contractors. And furthermore, um, those problems are tied to loans, which are tied to liens on their homes. So, um, you know, it, it can lead to even worse problems if a homeowner finds themselves stuck and unable to fully pay back the loan, and now they've got a lien on their home. So those problems have arisen in other states. Is Massachusetts uniquely protected against those, those problems? I did go and look. I, I'm not sure we're uniquely protected against those. I, I did go and look at, look at the Massachusetts, you know, experience so far. Um, you know, I, I would say, I mean, certainly the individual property owner bears the ultimate responsibility to determine, you know, is this contractor who's doing this project uh, uh, capable of doing it in a responsible way? I, I would add that the, certainly I would think that the financing, the private financers of which there are 18 now approved by mass development would I'm sure also take an interest in vetting the work being done by the contractor and looking at who is doing that work. Um, and I would say it, it, it does seem clear to me that mass development is, has a very rigorous vetting process for those financers. Um, mass development is not, you know, is not vetting an individual contractor at the end of the day, you know, again, that's the property owner's responsibility. So um, I, I wouldn't say that uh, those problems, there's no chance that those problems could happen in Massachusetts. But I do think as far as the financing piece, I, I do. it's clear to me that Mass Development's doing a pretty heavy vetting of, of those financers who, again, would presumably um, in their due diligence, uh, be taking a close look at the project and the capability of a contract. But, but do, the, but do the, the finance, the banks or whoever is financing really have an incentive to do that? I mean, they're getting a betterment. I mean, they're, they're basically having their loan guaranteed through this betterment. Is, is that really a cost they're going to assume? I, I think that's a serious concern. So, If I may, uh, Chair, um, I, one more question as a follow-up. Do, does this program that's being proposed to us involve um, putting the loan payment on, a, on the individual's tax bill, their property tax bill? That is correct. The loan payment becomes part of the tax bill which then can, if you can't, you know, if you can't make the accumulated um, tax plus loan payment, um, all of a sudden you've got a perhaps tax lien um, on your property. That, that that was my point. And I, they have apparently had that problem in some other states. Yeah, and it, it's to be clear, um, the, while it, while the, it is on the tax bill and the betterment and the betterment repayments are on the tax bill. If there was ever to be a foreclosure, it would not be the town pursuing the foreclosure. Um, it, it, so because because the town is essentially acting as a pass through for those payments to the finance. It would be the bank, but it, that still begs the question whether the bank. I mean, they have to go through the foreclosure process, but still they can get their money. Uh, so I, I think the question still is out there, you know, is there any incentive on the part of the bank to to make sure the contractors are, are legit? And maybe, you know, this this is a, a, a reason why we should make sure that, um, you know, homeowners are, are well educated as to what they what they should do uh, when looking for a contractor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, and I think that that really should be our our job. Thank
Is it, do you not agree? <laughs> I, it, it, it's not that I don't agree. I'm, I'm not sure. So for example, I mean, I, I'm, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel qual qual I wouldn't feel qualified as the town's finance director to evaluate whether or not a contractor, for example, is capable of doing. No, no that, that's that's not why. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. Not you know, really uh, knowing exactly how this program is going to be structured. I'm not sure this is is going to be easy. But I'm, all I'm saying is that um, you know, someone should tell homeowners. You know, what are the risks that they have to uh, themselves, um, you know, account for or or deal with, so they don't uh, end up losing their home uh, because you know they they you know, they didn't think about certain things. So. Right. Yeah. So. Well, and certainly something. I mean, certainly something I could we could pursue if is is that if a property owner seeks to have this agreement, we'd obviously have. An interaction with them in order to set it up through their their tax payment. I'd, I'd certainly be very happy to, um, you know, I, th I think I'd want to start with mass development and see if they have any informational material that can be shared with the taxpayer, with the property owner, you know, to say, yeah. have you gone through this checklist? That, that's certainly something I'm very happy to 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 look to look at. Yes, definitely. Yeah, there's another question in the um, it looks like Q and A box. And I think, well, I'll just ask the question. Does the PACE program require evaluation by a licensed engineer as part of the approval process? Um, I assume that's not the case. Not to my knowledge. I, I, I would say that each project, one, one piece I, met, I neglected to mention earlier is that each project is approved not only by mass development, by, but by the Department of Energy Resources. DOER. Um, so, and, and they are evaluating it for the efficiency um, and, uh, re and renewable and or renewable energy component of it to evaluate whether or not it is, it's, it's doing that efficiency or renewable um, aspects. So, um, does that help, you know, I mean, help answer that question? Uh, but well, I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure. I'm not sure specific to that to that question. Yeah. I do not know the answer. Yeah. Um, okay, any other discussion? May I ask one more question? Sure. Sorry. Um, if if you could sum up, uh, just what what are we voting to authorize tonight? Because um, I, I do hear you know that it it, it involves the town insofar as the uh, loan payment goes on an individual's property tax bill. Um, other than that, we're, we're not walking into any kind of a role where we vouch for anybody or, um, or or have to supervise anything. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, and, and that's not what I was suggesting. Rather, you know, maybe mass development or maybe the town just gives them a checklist of things to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's something you know, Matt. I I think it's a great point, and it's definitely something. If if any homeowner or you know property owner was seeking to do a project like this, um, I'd certainly seek to, you know, and I I, I think Mass Development and or uh, Mass Department of Energy Resources should have some easy to read consumer material. To say, you know, does this project make sense? So definitely, I, I'll certainly commit to seeking that information yeah. and sharing. Okay, uh, why don't we vote? We've been on this for over ten minutes. It looks like. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> so I move to authorize the town of Brookline to participate in the Massachusetts Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy Program, as described in the resolution included in the items materials and authorize the town administrator to sign on behalf of the select board any agreements or, or authorizations that he deems reasonable. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> on, on favor, uh, John? Aye. Uh, Miriam? Aye. Mike? Aye. And Chair votes aye. Thank you, Lincoln. Thank you all. Have a nice night. Okay. <laughs>
Next, uh, Tom Barrasso is uh, here to talk about uh, the Heath School Solar Project. Um, I see he's, in, he's here. Okay, good. Hello. And Charlie Young also contributing to this conversation. Good evening. How are you? Thank you for permitting me to, to speak tonight. Um, we've got an update for the Heath Project. And in fact, I think solar across the board, um, we've been asked to look at the difference between a power purchase agreement and actual ownership of solar arrays or battery storage. And I don't think we can move forward with the project right now until we can answer that question with some fine detail. And Mr. Young is, is nodding his head, so I'm sure he's going to back me up on, on that as well. So that's going to involve some analysis in order to get some fine-tuned numbers. And so we are going to need some time to do that. Uh, so I don't see anything, again, moving forward very quickly. Uh, or Heath is sort of ready to go with the design through Solect, which is our regular power purchase agreement uh, contractor that handles that through some state contracts with power options. Uh, they can also do a build out, which we would actually own. But again, we need to know what those apple to apple comparisons are going to be. I've made contact with some consultants who can help us with that. I'm hoping to get a couple of proposals in my hand that we can actually react to and then be able to build out with that with uh, Mr. Young and figure out what we need to do next in order to, to keep the process rolling so that we can continue building solar. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Any questions? Quick one. So uh, wait, let me just ask. So you're not asking us to do anything other than to be patient and wait. Okay. Be patient and wait, correct. Okay. John. And, and <coughs> a, var a variation on, on Bernard's question. Um, so what this means is that we won't be bringing to the upcoming town meeting, the, the annual town meeting in May, a proposal one way or the other, because we won't be ready to bring a proposal one way or the other. That's going to depend on exactly how fast we can turn this around in terms of an analysis. Maybe it is faster than we think possible. If that's the case, I'll defer to Mr. Young in terms of how quickly we can get that uh, in there. And if you have, you have two days, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, I'm mean, looking the special within a within a town meeting. I thought. <laughs> yeah, we yeah we can do that, but. <laughs> It'd be just as well, but there's a limit to how close we can get to town meeting before we introduce something like that. People have, to, you know, yeah. we and town meeting members need time to think about it. Correct. And just for some additional context, uh, the Heath School was pretty much ready to go. We did run into some issues during COVID with supply chain, and the supply chain really wasn't related to the solar uh, facilities or the solar equipment. It was related to building roofing materials that we couldn't get to repair the roof. So that went into a sort of holding patent, and then we slipped on the date which uh, town meeting authorized us to actually do that project. So we do have to come back to town meeting and say, okay, let's authorize this again. John? I just want to be sure that people listening um, understand that no, no one on this board, as far as I know, um, opposes there being solar projects and solar panels on roofs um, of town buildings. But there's a history to this, which is that um, the, the projects we've done to date with these power purchase agreements um, precipitated quite a bit of discussion when they were first proposed. And there, it was kind of like fought to a draw as to whether <laughs> we were making the right decision to go ahead with leases as opposed to owning the panels ourselves. And it is still one of those questions that people disagree on. And the trend, I would say, since we embarked on this and started doing some leasing arrangements um, in other, on other buildings, the trend has been towards the, the, the advocates for owning the panels, you know, I think um, kind of uh, prevailing uh, more often than not in this particular economic argument, you know, which is which is the better deal for the town to lease or to own. And um, that's why we need the analysis. And I think we should take all the time we need so that we get it right. And things have changed in the marketplace. When we started out, the PPA was not, not the only option, but it definitely was a more financial stable option. The uh, Inflation Reduction Act 
has opened the door a bit to uh, municipalities and, and other nonprofits who could not take advantage of the tax credits before, but now we can. So that does change the equation a bit, and we really need to understand what that means. Good. Okay, any further discussion? We will be patient and wait for you. Thank you. Okay, that is the end of our agenda. Um, any uh, Anything that anyone wants to say before we end this meeting? <laughs> no? Did you have your hand up, Tom? Yeah, I think we also needed to talk about the Mass DOER pilot project. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Which is a little bit more uh, in depth than than the heat school and solar, so a little little bit more uh, paramount for what we need to decide. So, uh, you do have in your packet a memo that was put together between myself, uh, head of planning, Kara Bruton, and uh, legal uh, to sort of look at what we want to propose for a warrant article to adopt this. So there's long history to this, but uh, and, and you guys have known about it longer than I have been here in terms of the push to get uh, the fossil free uh, sort of a home rule petition passed through uh, the state. That happened with the work of a lot of people that were way ahead of me uh, before I got here. Uh, it was struck down by the AG's office, uh, which sort of left us in kind of a limbo. I believe everybody did appeal that. Uh, the thrust of moving that forward actually energized a number of other communities in Massachusetts to try to do the exact same thing that Brookline was doing. Uh, so at the sort of nth hour of uh, the Baker administration, the governor signed uh, an order to have Mass DOER create a pilot project for 10 municipalities in the state. And we are one of those municipalities that are on that list. In fact, we were number three in order of, of the people who petitioned. So what we need to do is try to figure out how to move the needle and, and get into this pilot program in order to test what DOER wants to do. Uh, the problem right now is that none of this stuff is set in stone yet. So we're sort of reacting to things that are still in draft form. We have some draft language from the state, which we're trying to put into a warrant article. Uh, Ziab uh, has the only seen my memo for the first time today. Uh, so therefore, I need some feedback from them as well with respect to timing dates and, and some other parameters that they want to uh, chime in with as well. And I believe uh, uh, Wendy Stahl is actually here tonight if she wants to comment. So that's that's the item up for discussion is how to move forward with this. It should probably be a warrant article from the planning department at my desk, or it could be a warrant article from the select board. <clears throat> Yeah, any questions or any, any thoughts on that? Mm. In, in terms of there's no uh, particular- By the way, uh, yes, promote Wendy. Sorry. I, I'm sorry, I, I got a message here asking me- what Oh yeah, for uh, uh, Wendy Stone, well, that's fine. Yeah. Um, there's no particular uh, advantage, disadvantage when it comes to town meeting uh, to having this from the select board or from the department, am I is that am I correct about that? Legal may have a different perspective, uh, but as far as I can see, no. Uh, personally, I'm happy to give the, the department credit for getting this going because they're, um, they're doing the legwork. Hmm. Wendy, did you have something to say? Hi, thank you. Um, first, I want to thank Director Barrasso for bringing this article forward. I agree the department has done all the legwork on this, and I think they should get the credit for it. Um, I, I did, as, as Tom mentioned, I just saw the draft for the first time a couple hours ago, um, and I think it's great. And he incorporated essentially what the state has asked us to do, which is what we need to do. The one. Um, the one aspect of the draft that I think needs to be changed that I would recommend changing is the implementation date. Um, in the draft, it's recommended that we establish uh, the starting date for this pilot as July 1st, 2024. Um, but I think that is um, much too far distant in the future. 
considering we originally passed our fossil fuel free bylaw in 2019, people have known that this is coming down the pipeline for quite a few years already. Um, so I would recommend changing the implementation date to at the earliest when we adopt the specialized code, which would be July 1st, 2023. Um, and at the latest, January 1st, 2024, which would be a six month lead time. Um, essentially what this pilot program does is it uh, narrows the specialized building code that we adopted in January. And it just, the specialized code has three building pathways you can choose from. Only one of those is fossil fuel free. So what this pilot program does is it eliminates the two pathways that aren't fossil fuel free and it simplifies the code. So it might actually be simpler for our building department to just do one training for like whatever version we'll end up using in the end instead of a certain training for the establishment of a specialized code and then a year later a new training for entering into the pilot program. <laughs> But uh, either way, whether the earliest date would be July 1st or the latest date, January 21st, I don't think we can wait. I mean, January 1st, 2024, I don't think we can wait until July 2024. It just doesn't make sense as the town that initiated this process in the whole state to delay entry. Thank okay. you. Tom, do you have a response to that? Sure. One thing I'll add is that we've been working really closely with the building department uh, and, and their department head to make sure that that we're in in lockstep with what they need to do because they're the tip of the spear for sort of enforcing this so in reality uh, we we need to sort of make sure that we're getting their feedback so dan bennett could not be here tonight but he did send me an email that said he there's a concerns that he has with some of the code changes and the updates for this year and he was pretty confident that the effective date of july 1 2024 is something that they can meet in the building department um, so again, this is still sort of a work in progress. Uh, I think mean, we need to take that back up under consideration in the short time that we have to make sure that we can do this uh, or look at uh, modifications uh, after we get all the input from DOER. Because once again, we're looking at everything that we've got in the Warren article is, is draft. Uh, so uh, there may be changes that we need to adopt even further down the line, uh, which may be in the, in the next town meeting. But I'd like to get something on the books because again as wendy pointed out we, we sort of want to be the first people in the pool on this one since we were so proactive in trying to get this through realizing that it was struck down by the ag's office and so this is now a path forward maybe slightly different from the path forward that we may have initially initialized in our own home rule petition but it's still a path forward to sort of get us moving uh, and regulatory enhancements is definitely something we're going to need to embrace uh, and embrace quickly in order to make sure that we hit our goals of, of net zero uh, or uh, fossil free and, and uh, zero emissions by 2040. Okay, Mike. Yeah, um, I, Tom, what's the um, sort of timing that it, it's one thing to say, well, we'll implement it by X date, but if the if DOR, <laughs> DOR hasn't made up its mind uh, by then, that's problematic. So, um, any sense at all, when, or Wendy, uh, uh, any sense at all of how fast uh, the department is likely to, to act? They've implement. They, they've implied that by the end of March, they'll have their final regulations. Uh, okay, that's final regulations. The question is, how will they act on our app? Because we have to apply. Is that correct? You mean how quickly will they process the applications? Yeah. Yeah. That I do not know. DOER is sort of uh, flying by the seat of their pants on this one as well. Right. Um, yeah. and state action is sometimes a little bit of a black hole. So uh, yeah, and and I have been told that it's it's not that they're not behind this, but they're definitely it, it was sort of done at the last hour of the Baker administration. Now we've got a new governor. There's new folks that are heading up DOER. So now mm -hmm. everything sort of has to fall into place to make sure that. The, you know, none of this stuff gets sort of thrown off the table. Uh, but I think, again, we're on the correct path. How quickly they'll be able to adapt and get something out is still up in the air. Well, you know, I think um, realistically, uh, July 1st, 2023, probably, I, it would be amazing if the OER does their job by then. So it would be far better for us to say six months or even three months after we receive approval from the OER. 
And if, yeah. that's, if that's acceptable, that's great. You know, uh, uh, th that way um, uh, there's no date certain, unfortunately, but anybody who's, uh, who's considering construction uh, knows that it's coming. And so maybe three months from the, uh, the date that, uh, that we're um, allowed to proceed uh, would, be, would be sensible. Correct. John? I'm sorry, Tom, um, did you want to say something? No, go ahead. It's so, John. So I just am seeking clarification as to the choice that's in front of us. If I understand correctly, um, uh, Wendy and Tom are in agreement that we should participate in the program and that um, the way to do so requires that we adopt a bylaw. And I think they're in agreement that we should do it at this upcoming town meeting. And that's why they're here um, so that we will approve putting that in the warrant for the upcoming town meeting. And aside from that, there's a slight disagreement between the two of them over a date <laughs> that is in the bylaw. But but you're in agreement that you would really like the select board to approve this on the warrant for this upcoming. OK, yes. I mean, you've got my vote. <laughs> I guess that's the simplest way to put it. <laughs> okay. Any other discussion? And, and Tom, you know, Tom is our agent here. He, he's supposed to tell us what what makes sense. And we're all in agreement that that's going to come from the department, planning department, and not from the select board. So that was the other question. Too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the select board would never be able to do what the planning department did through you. Thank you very much for what you've done. Okay. <clears throat> do we need a vote on this? Uh, I, I think we do. I think do. So. Yeah, we're going to, if, yeah. if, we're, if we're putting a warrant, well. You uh, don't. Oh, we you don't. would you would need to vote if you were sponsoring yeah, if yeah. if you the select board were choosing to sponsor this you would take a vote to to sponsor it but you are not going to the planning department will move forward and ideally file their warrant article tomorrow before Thursday's deadline oh okay. do that Tom we will try our best <laughs> okay so if you uh, if you have any holes in it um leave yourself make it broad so that uh, if you need to amend it down to something that's narrower, um, the moderator will allow it. If you need to expand the warrant article, moderator doesn't like that. You, you follow what I'm saying? Yes, I do. Okay, all right, good. You, if you have any question at all, talk to the town council, make sure that uh, th that you make it as broad as you need to make it. Always talk to town council. <laughs> oh, well, not always, but in this case. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the select board has said put it on the planning department's uh, warrant uh, list. Yeah. And um, go for it. Great. Thank you all. Great. Anything Great. else? Thank you, Tom. I would say the last thing that the select board needs to consider is the secondary item under this was just kind of the last call for any select board sponsored warrant articles. You know, by this, you had this discussion last week. By this yeah. point, most of you have a good sense of what's probably coming down the pike and if there's anything you know that the board would like to sponsor we would need to be aware of that tonight so that we could file on your behalf in the next day and a half yeah. does anyone have um one article they want to uh looks like what to sponsor um miriam i actually have a, a question which is there i don't know I don't know the details, so I apologize, but there's potentially a warrant article on uh, Latin, Latinx, Hispanic uh, Heritage Month. And my question is, does it need to be a warrant article? Is that something we could just do as select board? Oh, That's yeah. a great question, Miriam. You took care of this at the last town meeting when a, a warrant article was coming forward about Asian American uh, Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And uh, the select board preemptively went ahead and committed to putting out a proclamation and making that day official in the town of Brookline, just like you've done tonight with Women's History Month and last month with Black History Month. So that's absolutely something that you could do uh, to preempt that warrant article. So I'll, I'm going to reach out to the person and let them know we can take that up as a select board. Right. Well, 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 what, wait, what what is it that they are trying to accomplish other than just recognizing this year's uh yeah i think just i mean i have to find out that's why i said i'm not 
I'm not a hundred percent sure on all of the details. Um, I, I will find that out, but if it is similar. Yeah. Then, every year we'll, we'll do a proclamation. I mean, yeah. So yeah. let me, let me reach out and chat with that person and, and they can always file and then not move it. If, if it's something we can handle as a select board. Yeah, I, I would say anytime you can avoid a warrant article, an article. and especially 100%. a bylaw, <laughs> good grief. Let's, uh, let, let's not complicate life anymore than we need to. Good grief, less grief. Less grief. <laughs> okay. Uh, another quick side question. Is there any update on, uh, I think the extension of the meeting uh, exemptions is out of ways and means. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. <laughs> the Senate version of the, yeah. of the bill. Yeah. yeah. So the House version has passed, right? Yes, correct. And, and I don't think that there's a, a, a difference between the Senate and House, is there? None. So their 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 um, reconciliation will probably be easy on that. So, well, keep your fingers crossed. In case well, I get it, depends on whether you it depends on whether or not you really like uh, remote town meetings. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Mike, we've discussed this. <laughs> yeah. I'll be quiet now. <laughs> okay that's the end of the meeting let's end it all let's right. not, I'll, i won't see you all next week wish me safe travels and uh okay. yeah. so yeah. a postcard <laughs> do they do that anymore that's a good question i'm not sure <laughs> <It goes. laughs> i'll bring you one bernard that, 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 final. that shows my age <laughs> <laughs> oh take so, care